Okay. Uh, can I ask if we're aware of any apologies? Uh, William Humphrey has offered apologies. William Humphrey, thank you, Clark. Okay. Chairperson's business. Can I advise members um, that um, in terms of uh, business undertaken since the last meeting, um, I have no chairperson's business. Clark, content? Yeah. Okay. Uh, draft draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of 1st of July 2020 at page 6 and seek members agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Members need the answer. Agreed. Agreed. Members? Agreed. Yeah, thank you. Agreed. Okay. Uh, there are no matters arising. Any members wish to uh, raise any items? So we need to make our uh, witnesses nope. are present, so we're good. Okay, then, agenda item five, members, uh, is our uh, oral briefing from the National Children's Bureau on their report, um, which has contributed towards the Emotional Health and Mental Wellbeing Framework for the Department of Education. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to keep me in the spotlight function, remove all of the members and add witnesses, Celine McStravick and Claire Doris, and keep them there for this briefing. Can I ask members to note in their meeting packs a briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 14, an NCB summary paper, and a copy of the NCB report on emotional health and wellbeing at page 28, correspondence from the Department of Education and the Education Authority on the development of the framework, Protect Life 2, and the demand for the independent counselling service at page 32 to 238, Correspondence from the Minister for Health on the linkage between the framework and the Mental Health Action Plan at page 246. An ETI report 2018 on emotional health and wellbeing support in schools and EOTIS centres at page 250. And previous Department of Education correspondence relating to the independent counselling service at page 275. Can I also ask members to note at page 5 of tabled items uh, Department of Education response on the online safety strategy. Can I confirm then that Celine McStravick, the Director of the National Children's Bureau, and Claire Doris, Senior Research and Policy Analyst at the National Children's Bureau, are with us? You are indeed. Yes, I'm here. You're, you're very Hello, welcome. Hello, yes. You're very welcome. Um, one of the first things that the committee considered when we reconvened in January 2020 was the development by the Department of its Emotional Health and Wellbeing in Education Framework. The framework has had £5 million allocated to it. It features as one of the key restart work streams and is meant to be in place by December 2020. When the Department briefed the committee in February 2020 about the framework, officials struggled to tell us very much about progress or the background to the framework. Uh, the committee sought a briefing so that we could fill in some of these blanks and we're therefore very happy to welcome the National Children's Bureau uh, today to tell us about your work and your report uh, towards the Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework and invite you uh, to make opening remarks to the committee. Hello, Chris and uh, fellow committee members. Many thanks for this invitation. Really appreciate this because, as you can imagine, this issue is becoming even more important. Uh, to children and young people in Northern Ireland. Just by way of information on how we're going to do this presentation, I so wish I was in the room with you all. Uh, but for today, I'm going to give a, just a few minutes a bit about the background and then uh, delighted that Claire is going to join us. Claire was the, one of the leading researchers in this report, so she'll give a bit more detail on the content and then it'll come back to me for some views and questions on next steps. And you can also ask Claire questions at that stage. So just a reminder that uh, NCB, we don't deliver services for children and young people. We sit in a very interesting part of the system uh, where we're very independent and we can interrogate policy, we can uncover evidence and, of course, then develop better ways to deliver services for children and young people. But what's most important is our uh, real commitment to getting the voices of children and young people heard. Uh, so I think this is where my um, real passion is today, is to make sure those children's voices are heard as well 
and how they're experiencing life in school. So this study was actually commissioned in 2018 by the Department of Health and the Public Health Agency. And in a way, we came to the study with a huge breadth of experience because NCB also run the Emotional Health and Wellbeing Partnership for Schools in England. So we have over 50 different organisations involved in that partnership. And really that's about bridging that gap between school and the community. We bring health around the table in as well and understand that what goes on within those school buildings actually is really important, that culture of emotional health and wellbeing, but it also permeates outside those physical walls. So it's important to have that partnership approach. So we had all also developed lots of resources and guidance for that emotional health and wellbeing partnership in England. So we came to this study with that background knowledge and we were delighted to take on this project. The project was actually a scoping study to inform the development of the emotional health and wellbeing framework. Um, and again, I really welcome the committee's interest in this area and their commitment to seeing that emotional health and wellbeing framework delivered. Um, so in terms of content, I'm going to hand over to Claire Doris now. He's going to give you a wee bit about the how it all, how we delivered the project, but also what we find out when we went out, when we went out to all of those schools. Over to you, Claire. Thank you very much, Celine. Thank you, committee, for having us. Um, you have the research report in front of you there, um, and you'll see that it's quite a lengthy document um, with an awful lot of findings in it. Um, so I'm going to do my very best just to give you a very swift overview um, of the methodology and the key findings. Um, so just to remind you of the research process, because it was quite robust research process, which is really important for us in terms of informing um, any kind of future policy or strategy. So we did a rapid re review of the kind of published evidence. So what's already out there, what do, what do the kind of big studies show? Um, we also did a survey of all the schools across Northern Ireland. Um, quite difficult to get responses from schools in general in terms of these surveys, but we had 283 responses across the different types of schools, which is really good for this kind of work. We carried out um, 23 in-depth semi-structured interviews and focus groups. So the important part there is the wide range of key stakeholders that we talked to. Um, because although this um, work focuses on schools um, and well-being support within schools, it's really, really important to remember that well-being of children and young people is much more widely applicable than within schools. So we talk to we talk to lots of stakeholders inside of schools, but we also talk to practitioners, policy make, makers, commissioners outside of schools across the statutory community voluntary sector. Um, and importantly, we talk to children, young people and parents. And the last part of the research then was eight case study visits to schools um, right across again, nursery, primary, post-primary, special schools. And we visited an EOTIS project, so education other than at school. Um, and again, the role of those case studies was to kind of see for ourselves what was happening in schools to talk to um, the principal and different team members to see what they were doing differently because the schools for the case study visits were chosen based on their survey responses and that they had um, demonstrated um, significant practice in terms of supporting well-being. So that was to get a kind of in-depth view. The process then, after carrying out all of the research and analysing the findings, we presented the research findings to the steering group that Celine's already mentioned, so chaired by the Department of Education, but with representatives right across public health, um, Department of Health, Education Authority and community sector as well. So again, the important point there is that this is very much cross-sector, um, cross-organisation, and that steering group themselves interpreted the research and developed the recommendations, so all signed off on it. So um, a very much um, collaborative approach. Um,
just want to start off um, with a quick reminder of the kind of statistics that we have in Northern Ireland in terms of what we know about children and young people's well-being. So the kind of statistics that we quote are things um, like the suicide rates across Northern Ireland. So we know that suicide rates for children and young people in Northern Ireland are higher proportionally than across the rest of the four nations. We also quote statistics around number of children in receipt of antidepressant medication um, or number of children and young people who are referred to um, children and adolescent mental health services. The important point there is that all of those statistics tell us something about children and young people's mental ill health rather than their emotional well-being. So one of the, the kind of overarching findings from the research was about the definition and being clear that actually we need to support positive emotional well-being rather than intervening when the issues have already um, started. Okay, so the, the kind of in line with the prevention and early intervention approach. Um, so one of the, the kind of key recommendations from the research was around defining the difference between mental ill health um, and positive emotional well-being. Positive emotional well-being then from the, the kind of wider research um, is very much a, has long-term impact. So emotion, positive emotional well-being for children and young people leads to academic success, leads to um, longer-term stable employment, leads to reduction in criminal behaviours, risk-taking behaviours, um, and a general overall um, higher satisfaction with life. Um, and poor emotional well-being can manifest then in things like antisocial behaviour, relationship difficulties, substance misuse. Um, it can lead to mental illness, but doesn't necessarily have to. Okay, so a really important distinction there. And what that contributes to is the ways in which we would be supporting children and young people to build that positive emotional well-being. So if we look at it as the kind of preventative approach, then the key elements are going to be things like building resilience, building self-esteem, building kind of motivation to engage in um, life, in academic, the academic world, um, and in kind of problem-solving behaviours. So the research in terms of what's already written out there and what people told us is that those are the issues that need to be focused on to really take that kind of preventative approach. We also find that there are risk factors that make it more likely that children and young people would suffer from poor emotional well-being. So gender is a really interesting one. Um, we know that suicide rates for young males are higher in Northern Ireland, but we also know that girls are more likely to suffer from um, issues such as eating disorders, self-esteem issues, um, are more likely to present with self-harm. So it's not that um, it adversely affects one gender more than the other. There are lots of kind of competing issues in there and it's about the approach taken. Um, membership of a minority group, absolutely very much a, a higher risk factor as is sexual orientation or children, young people who have a special educational need. Um, and again, the issues that come into that are some of those groups are more likely to experience bullying, more likely to experience stigma, um, and have general difficulties in fitting in for numerous reasons. Other issues that we find, so family factors in terms of parental relationships, attachment issues, so absolutely this goes right back to birth and links very much with the kind of infant mental health work um, that's happening across Northern Ireland. Um, parental ill health very much contributes to children's well-being, um, family history, and then the discussion on adverse childhood experiences. In terms of the findings from the school survey, um, we ask schools to report on their top five concerns in terms of emotional well-being. Um, for primary schools, the top two issues were self-esteem and anxiety. 71% um, of primary schools reported anxiety as being the most um, concerning issue for them. 
And in terms of post-primary schools, 89% of schools reported anxiety as being the top issue, followed by stress, self-esteem, self-harm, and family concerns come in there as well. Okay, so that was the, the key finding from the survey, but then across all of the discussions that came out very clearly as anxiety being the kind of most concerning, fastest growing area. Um, and also a discussion around very young children presenting with anxiety, more so than would ever have been seen and a big concern. Um, and in terms of the stakeholder discussions on what was causing that or what the issues were, um, the focus was on social media, of course, which is commonly discussed. Um, so things like body image, unrealistic expectations presented by social media, um, the FOMO discussion, which I, a new term I learned, so fear of missing out um, and that other people's lives are better absolutely applies to adults as well as children and young people. Um, Cyberbullying, a big issue in terms of, of the online world as well, because bullying doesn't end at the school gates. It continues into the child's bedroom and can continue all night. Um, so there's no kind of cutoff point there. And the other big issue discussed then was academic pressure. Um, linked to competition for university places, linked to competition in the job market, but also big discussions on the transfer test, um, the uncertainties around that, um, and young children um, seeing that as a, a kind of judgment um, on them at a very young age and the early preparation from the kind of previous year and spending the summer beforehand preparing for tests. Um, so lots of discussion there. In terms of who has a role to play in supporting well-being, so again, there is a, a feeling among respondents that schools get a lot of the pressure and that schools are number one um, key to supporting well-being, but actually the findings show it's much wider with the parents and carers, obviously, um, at the top of the list in terms of supporting well-being, wider family members, schools, of course, but the voluntary and community sectors, statutory services, anybody who generally has ongoing contact with children and young people has an opportunity to support their well-being um, and has an opportunity also to spot issues if there are concerns. Um, but the issue around school is that, of course, children and young people spend quite a lot of time in school. Therefore, it's a significant opportunity to put those kind of preventative approaches in place. The research told us some issues in terms of the systems and why we're not best supporting um, emotional well-being. So the, the, one of the key discussions was around the kind of parity of esteem between physical and mental health. So there's always been traditionally a priority on physical health um, and especially in terms of prevention, um, it's, it's been physical health first so from right from birth, there's the immunization program, for example. Um, so the real need to shift that discussion to mental health is as important as physical health and both are interconnected. There very much has been a move towards a kind of whole child approach, that holistic approach. Um, but again, departments work in silos, organizations work in silos. And so there's a need to be better joined up to see that a child's kind of physical health, emotional health, education, all of those issues run into one another. So the, the ways to approach them need to be joined up. Issues around um, funding and particularly the need for long term investment. So lots of voluntary sector organizations told us there's lots of things they'd love to do. But when they're working on short term funding, it takes effort and it takes um, investment to build up the resources to train the staff and to build those relationships, even with children and young people. Um, and if their funding is short term there's little opportunity to do all of that. 
Um, we have a well-discussed postcode lottery in Northern Ireland in terms of access to services. And quite often, money and effort goes towards firefighting rather than investing strategically from the kind of early years and onwards. In terms of schools barriers, um, schools reported a number of barriers to supporting well-being properly. Um, again, funding and budgetary constraints comes number one. Um, otherwise, issues around lack of training for staff, um, lack of it's not that there's a lack of interventions there are lots and lots of programs available lots of programs that schools can use lots of programs that schools are already using but it's more about the guidance as to what actually works best how do they know which one to trust and um, should they be paying for kind of private services um, or private organizations to deliver um, the whole issue of if we pay for something is it better quality um, and what's actually available out there. So lack of guidance, I guess, on what they should be doing. So very much disparity of approaches across schools and um, quite often guided by the principal's own personal um, thoughts or approaches. And if well-being is 100 percent their top concern, then that will show in the school. The kind of connection between the health system, so in terms of referrals to um, adolescent mental health services, schools can't make referrals directly there. So what they need to do is if they spot an issue with a child in their school, they will have to tell the parent. So contact the parent and then leave it with the parent to report to the GP to say there's an issue and then the GP makes the referral. There's so many um, points within that process where that child's issues may be lost. Okay, so something around the need to connect, make those connections better. In terms of school specific issues, schools talked a lot about the way schools are judged. So ju unofficially, there are school league tables available out there and those are used to judge how good a school is. Parents look at them. Um, schools have to report on their academic progress. A lot of principals felt like um, that's what their priority had to be. So if schools were judged more on the well-being side of things, um, the principals and the schools and the staff would feel kind of better able to focus their attentions there. Other things um, in terms of school issues, the staff well-being. So there are lots of competing pressures on staff in schools. Um, and the number of people who've said to me recently, you can't pour from an empty cup or affix your own um, oxygen mask before helping others. All the same thing that you can't support um, an emotionally vulnerable young person if you yourself are emotionally vulnerable. So that kind of dual role of supporting staff who support children and young people, really important. Schools also feel quite unprepared to respond to some emotional concerns, are scared to intervene um, in case they do something wrong, say the wrong thing, get themselves into trouble. So that prevents a lot of people from trying. In terms of the most effective things that support children and young people in schools, the schools counselling service was the number one um, most important thing. And it supports children and young people across a wide range of issues. But the concern there is lack of capacity. So it currently doesn't, um, isn't currently funded for primary schools. Um, and is only available in post-primary schools. Lots of primary schools pay for their own counselling service. Um, but even within the fully funded um, post-primary schools, the capacity isn't there. The quality of kind of pastoral support and the individuals involved within the schools are also one of the kind of most effective things. So children and young people having 
someone who they know they can go to, that they can rely on. Um, and the vast majority of schools who we surveyed have someone who is responsible for pastoral care. Quite often that's the principal. Um, other times it's form teacher or um, perhaps the librarian or some office admin. So it's not just about, it's about the much wider school team and who the pupils feel that they can trust and who they can happily report to. Again, lots of other really um, useful interventions happening in schools. Um, one of the biggest um, recommendations from our research is around the need for a whole school approach and what that actually means. And Celine has mentioned the work that we do in England around supporting um, a whole school approach. So the kind of key elements of that are building an overall culture of well-being within the schools underpinned by appropriate and supporting policies and structures and strategies. Um, one of the questions we asked schools in the survey was around whether they had emotional well-being named in their school development plan. 74% of primary schools said they had and 94% of post-primary schools said that they had, which is really important because if it's named specifically as an action in their um, skill development plan, then they can um, invest the resources towards it. The other kind of key elements in a whole skill approach are around the skilled and supported workforce, so very much making sure that the emotional well-being of the wider workforce within schools is supported, but also investing in those, um, building the skills in terms of mental health first aid, emotional well-being support. And then in terms of the services, the really important issue is that there should be a balance between those universal preventative approaches um, alongside some targeted interventions to address the kind of wide variety of needs that are going to come up for individual children and young people across their lifespan, but also the wide range of children that are available in schools. And schools need to be flexible to be able to choose which of those meet the needs of their own individual schools, while still having that kind of overarching guidance of what they can trust and what's actually going to work to help them. So just a, a quick summary on the overarching recommendations from the research. So um, very much a need to talk about those kind of common definitions between emotional well-being and mental ill health and what the key elements of both of those are and what the issues are. Um, and underneath that, then what the kind of core skills are that we need to build in children and young people. So resilience. Um, self-esteem, all of those kind of things, um, and very much recognize and raise awareness of the evidence in terms of the really preventative approaches and the links to the very, very early years um, and the role of parents in terms of, of building the, the early skills and then the roles of school um, and youth services um, as the child grows and kind of comes into contact with those. The whole school, whole child approach then that we've talked about. Um, and importantly, recognizing the skills and expertise outside of schools um, and particularly in the youth service where often that kind of key relationship has the opportunity to build um, with children and young people. And a lot of the kind of youth sector that I talked to um, said that their approach would, they would much rather not deliver a kind of emotional well-being program directly, but they'll play football with a group of young people, build that trust. And then afterwards, when they're having a cup of tea and a chat, that's when the kind of discussions start to come out. So recognizing the value of those relationships. And then very much um, using all of the evidence sharing the learning and good practice, encouraging that partnership working and recognizing the kind of need for the whole child approach and using all of that to inform programs, services um, and strategies and approaches going forward. So that's a very whistle stop tour. Celine, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, no, I think that was uh, quite comprehensive. And I suppose the key point is that those recommendations at the end were developed by the whole advisory group that was chaired by the Department of Education. 
as a result of uh, reading the actual evidence that we presented. Thanks so much, Celine and Claire. Um, an extremely comprehensive scoping study um, has set out some of the, the key issues that um, that are consistent with um, issues that would have been raised with ourselves as well in terms of um, a, a concern in regards a disconnect between schools and health services. Um, that's been raised by children and young people um, as well. That's consistent with the, the comprehensive study you've completed, concerns around social media and judgment in relation to some uh, testing in particular, as well as a inadequate or lack of long-term funding for some good youth service provision as well. I, I can think of a number of examples of specific projects that um, seem to be achieving really positive outcomes, but do struggle from that. Uh, lack of, of long-term funding. Um, really helpful recommendations as well there for the department to take forward. Can I, can I kick off questions by asking um, wh when the, the, the scoping study was submitted to the Department of Education? Oh, the scoping study uh, was submitted in about uh, first draft about December 2018, and then the final draft February 2019. Okay, so I mean, obviously, um, emotional health and well-being has been a priority, or ought to have been a priority of the department for some time, and um, one could only conclude that that ought to be a, a, a an even bigger priority um, further to the, the, the impact of COVID-19 um, and the extent to which we're receiving concerns for what that might look like in terms of retur return to school in August and September. Um, are you, uh, I don't want to give you too many difficult questions here, but can I, can I get some understanding from, from you with regards to um, how urgent you think implementation of this, um, of this framework now is and what what ought to be a, a reasonable deadline for its for its delivery? Uh, I don't think that's a difficult question because I think the, anyone would say that this is a really urgent issue. I don't think anyone would disagree with how important this is for schools. If I said something a bit more positive, what we do see is activity in this area, but we don't feel it's coordinated. So we have the safeguarding board for Northern Ireland running, you know, a very successful trauma-informed culture program for education. We have new DA guidance on curriculum that just came out two weeks ago, and they actually mention the, you know, the need for the emotional well-being of the child to be paramount rather than attainment, and the caution schools against their use of language, not talking about catching up and lost learning. So those are really good glimmers of hope. You know, we have our mental health champion now in Siobhan O'Neill again, another thing we should be delighted with. Um, but again, we have, you know, the Nikki still waiting report. We have this report. So for me, there's a feeling that there's activity in the space, but it's not being brought together and schools are still being left to fend for themselves. You know, there's absolutely no doubt that our schools have faced incredible pressure during this time and have responded, some of them, exceptionally well. We ran a recent webinar for nearly 400 uh, teachers and consistently the discussion was about how do we prepare for these children coming back? How do we make sure that they feel safe and supported to then learn? Everyone knows that if our brain is suffering from anxiety and stress, it will not learn well. So the connection isn't separate there. Of course, it's all together. So for me, Chris, it is really, really urgent. Um, you know, we could look back and think, my goodness, if we had have had a wellbeing framework, would have been easier for schools to cope during this time. Or we look to the future and we said, how do we galvanize now? How do we bring all this together? And how do we get a sense of peace around this? and kind of move through the system. What was good about our scoping study was the advisory group was chaired by education, we had public health, with Department of Health there. And of course, I got really excited and thinking, my goodness, we might have something here that could actually speak to the system and change things in a sustainable way. 
but then it seemed to lose um, energy. So we really want to invest in that energy again, and hence we want the, the committee uh, to get even more interested in this area. Is a brief supplementary on that, Celine. Is December 2020 a good enough target date for delivery of the Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework? Well, for me, it's about quality as well as timing. So I would rather it was done well. I would rather it was done uh, using all the evidence they have. There is a tiny bit of me that wonders what's keeping it, because that scoping study now is technically out of date. Um, but, and we have so much uh, evidence of what we, what's been happening across the rest of the UK that could quickly be used to uh, write a framework and bring it together. There's a sense for me that we've done enough talking about it. Could we now get on with it? But at the same time, I don't underestimate the pressure that's been on civil servants. And I'm not here to advocate for the public sector. I'm here to advocate for children and young people. But, you know, this is a perfect storm. We've got COVID-19, we've got schools trying to cope. Now we've got school holidays. So this may be the time that we think, could we now work over the next eight to 12 weeks and aim for a date before December 2020. But of course, for me, it's just important to get right. Okay, keen to bring in other members, but one last question for me, uh, Celine and Claire, is um, my understanding is there is a what is called a Thrive model that is being trialled in England. Is, is that a, a type of approach that could be considered for Northern Ireland? I think what our scoping study showed was that with a number of different models and processes being used by schools, and in a way, you know, sometimes it's easy just to set a school, use this model, but it really has to be something that schools are comfortable with. And sometimes the approach is better working with what they already have and scaling it up. And truthfully, I think there's lots of um, answers here that are budget negative as well. There's something about acknowledging that the culture and the leadership in a school from the very moment you open a door impacts a child. And we really see that in the case studies we did in this research. So I don't want to say, I don't really want to recommend one model. I'm sure you'll understand, Chris. Sure. Uh, for me, it's just really important about saying, well, what's happening here already? A lot of scoping study covered that and the ETI report that you already referred to. So I think the information's there. And um, let's just see how we build from the strengths here in Northern Ireland. Okay. Sorry, you, just to add to what yeah, Celine said. I think the, the really important bit is about the flexibility. It's not what the program is, it's how it's used and it's how it's used in the kind of bigger picture. So every school has different needs, different populations, depending on where they're based and um, what the kind of demographics are. So it's about giving schools, I guess, the choice and the flexibility to decide what's going to work best for them, but within that bigger picture of the pastoral care. Okay, thank you. Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson uh, Karen Mullen, MLA? Morning, everyone. Thank Hi, Karen. How are you? Thank you, Claire and Salim, for coming along today and, and your presentation. Um, just as the Chair had said, in the context of uh, COVID, I suppose, you know, as you said as well, Salim, this is a perfect storm that is brewing. Um, and everything that has happened over the last number of months, it's absolutely crucial that the emotional health and well-being of our children are prioritised when schools reopen. Um, there's there's so much, and we don't have time to go over it all today. But uh, you know, I I would be very disappointed. I was very disappointed to see little reference in the Protect Life Two strategy around education in schools. Um, listening to yourself there, Celine, in relation to the joined up approach, the delays um, and, and all of that as well. The evidence, as you say, is there. We need to action it. We need to get on it. Um, uh, and, and as Claire had chatted about, uh, and I couldn't agree more, uh, about getting on early. Um, if, if we're serious um, about improving, um, it's all about getting on early and we talk about it all the time. I'm a big supporter of nurture programs and units 
and would be keen to see them in all schools alongside the, the access to counselling and a strong connection to the community and voluntary services mm -hmm. and alongside how you describe the youth sector's role as well. Um, that is all crucial, which takes the whole school approach to uh, the next level of including family and community. So I feel that that has to be our approach, all connected up, all working together. And that supports the school. And very much as a parent, you know, um, I see how difficult it is for schools dealing with so much. But, you know, September is going to be a massive undertaking. So thank you so much. Look, I'll get I have a couple of questions here. Just both yourselves and ETI have found an increasing level of pupil anxiety now at a younger age. Um, your report identifies causes, the causes, you know, there, there's been quite a few social media, family conflict, post primary transfer and bullying, and mo there's more. There's also been a suggestion in, in your report, and we're seeing this, that children are less resilient than what they used to be. Can you offer any su suggestion as to why this is? Well, uh, you know, it, it, you can offer suggestion, you know, and, there, and there's lots of evidence out there that just talks about a a different world that our children, young people live in. Uh, you know, the online world is our day to day existence. Uh, you know, there's less kind of connection with their peers in a real life uh, setting, you know, but also increasing pressure. Uh, Claire mentioned that the FOMO, the fear of missing out, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we, we see it every day when we're working with children, you know, but I would overlay that um, the kind of most vulnerable children, considering what it's like for children, yeah. uh, you know, who are in care. Uh, yeah. Consider what it's like here in children who are living in poverty. Overlay those other domains on a child's life, and you're increasing the pressure and anxiety at all stages. You know, Twenty-four percent of our children in Northern Ireland are living in poverty. Yeah. We should be ashamed of ourselves. Yeah. You know, we should be actually taking really proactive approach there to supporting those children to overcome those elements of poverty. So, you know, I could be here all day, Karen, talking about this, so I'm really trying not to take up all your time. But yeah. there's, there's definitely, when you try to see it from a child, young person's viewpoint today, their world is very different. And what we need to do as adults is to stop overlaying our adult response. This is what would have, would have happened to us. You know, it was interesting, uh, people talking about youth services in the scoping study, because, of course, some of our adults' um, solution to that is a youth centre. And, of course, we know our children don't go to youth centres. Mm -hmm. Physical buildings mm -hmm. is not the answer. Uh, but some really innovative youth approaches, you know, uh, unattached youth approaches on street corners, you know, out there in the community setting, that, that's what we can see is really helping. Those relationship building activities is what's important. And often that's more risky. That does mm -hmm. That feels a bit more difficult to us. Uh, but So there's something about adults, us getting over ourselves. Mm -hmm. and listening to our children and young people and actually doing something that we think could help them as opposed to just give, doing the same old thing over and over again, the thing that's easier for us, which is usually opening a grant programme and hoping for the best. No, I know. Sorry, just to, to add to that, another side of the coin is around the lack of um, screening for emotional issues in the kind of very early years. Um, and in the absence of that screening, it is only when the, the kind of bigger issues have developed that children and young people are spotted and the, the support is given. And one of the things that came out of the research was around teachers' role in identifying. So there, if there isn't that kind of early years screening, and there, there has been um, a pilot study through the Early Intervention Transformation Programme of the Ages and Stages questionnaire, um, being used in the kind of early years um, to try and identify some emo social and emotional issues. But in the absence of a screening program, it's quite often when children go to school and their teachers notice that there's something wrong or that they're just slightly out of sorts. Um, that's when the issues are picked up. Um, and that's probably mm -hmm. going to be one of the issues. So at the minute, children and young people are, are at home and they're not in contact with those kind of key um, people within the schools who would be spotting those issues. So when they return to school in September, 
there's potentially going to be an increase in um, that side of things. Yeah, so thank you, Celine. I totally agree. No child should be living in poverty. Um, I think in relation to the youth service approach as well, I also agree. And I think this uh, COVID situation has, has threw us into a world of technology, where particularly our youth service, and we are very cautious because of child protection and all our issues, but it has opened up a new world. And we are at the youth service is ac able to access children at home who don't go to um, those facilities. And, and Claire, you know, it is, you know, why do we always wait for a crisis? You know, we're waiting for the crisis to happen before, as you say, get on early. Just in relation to the point that you met, Claire, uh, do, you, do you believe that the Department of Education should be working with the Department for Economy? Um, around a teacher training um, and ensuring that additional training for new teachers and emotional health and well-being is put in place um, at, at that stage. Absolutely. And yeah, and I, sorry, Claire. I, I think the progress made by the Safeguarding Board and their trauma-informed kind of culture program and they're working with Strom Millis and trying to embed some understanding of the impact of adverse childhood experiences and trauma and anxiety and stress on children. So there, there are some, you know, as I talk about glimmers of hope, uh, but I just wish it was a bit more strategic and uh, was, was funded properly. You know, yeah. that program run by the Safeguarding Board, you know, they've achieved a huge amount with, with four or five staff. Uh, so we'd just like to see that a bit more uh, sustained. But definitely teachers need to understand this. You know, it's not just about the lesson plan. But truthfully, I think teachers do. Yeah. Truthfully, yeah. Uh, you know, as I said, we, we see really good examples of where uh, teachers are responding well to these issues, but it's just not consistent. Mm -hmm. It's just not, it's almost happening by virtue of the relying on the teacher's own professionalism. Highly professional workforce, but could we make it a bit easier for them? Yeah. Could you be a bit more consistent across Northern Ireland and say, this is what we've been, here's some tools to help you, yeah. here's some easy referral pathways, here's some things you could do in the classroom, you know, as I said, when I saw the recent Department of Education guidance uh, on curriculum that came out there at the end of June, I was really surprised, really welcomed it and thought, well, we've got it in black and white here from the Department of Education. What's more important is emotional well-being than actually the learning. And that, that was really good. And I just think we need to build from that. How, how do we then make that actually the mantra yeah. for all education? Yep. Okay. Chair, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Claire, Thanks, Karen. Robin Newton, MLA. Uh, thank you, Chair. And can I thank uh, Celine and Claire for coming along uh, to us this morning or speaking with us this morning. And <clears throat> I think uh, just uh, in general, your report is kind of echoing um, a number of the issues that I think probably all members of, of the committee have been uh, articulating uh, over uh, the last six months of, of, of our meetings. Uh, it's a very welcome report and, and uh, I do accept uh, the holistic approach to the development of a child that, that is absolutely necessary. And indeed, uh, I know that I'm certain all members of the committee would like to see a greater um, investment in our children rather than a cost of our education. Um, I've only one uh, simple uh, question um, to whoever wishes to, to pick it up. And it's building on the, the previous question of uh, initial teacher training and the relationship between the Department of Economy, Health uh, and, and Education. Uh, and I think the, the, the question on embedding these issues within teacher training, but also maybe particular modules for qualified teachers as they continue their mm -hmm. professional development, an approach mm -hmm. where they can, the teachers can add to their portfolio of knowledge and perhaps even qualifications in this field. Maybe, um, how, how would you think that, or in your initial discussions with the Department of the Economy, how do you think they might react uh, to that? I, I think this is about really raising confidence of the teaching profession as well. 
and exchanging good practice. You know, often when we work with teachers or bring them together, they learn as much from each other as any external training program. So again, something like this, Robin, isn't, you know, I don't think we should be afraid about extra cost or what the, the what this will need in terms of budget. I think if we just acknowledge that teachers, if they started teaching 20 years ago or 10 years ago, have new things to learn. And I don't think any teacher would disagree with that. So why not? You know, why not offer this as a continual professional development but emotional well-being of children? I can't see any negative in that. Just in terms of the teacher who may opt to attend programmes in this area, are there, give me a question, are there specific qualifications that they, they might add to their portfolio or their career? Well, interestingly, and I'll, I'll, I'll name check the Safeguarding Board again here because their trauma-informed program has specific modules for education, you know, and they can go and be a train the trainer in trauma-informed in culture, etc. So that's useful. Um, this scope and study, study didn't look at any specific modules for the teaching profession, Robin, so I don't want to claim any knowledge in that area. What I would say is that we could really see that in some schools, if they had a pastor lead or a safeguarding lead and someone was taking leadership in that area, they often sought out their own learning and understanding. Um, and although that's good in some schools, we really wouldn't want to see it being one teacher's responsibility. You know, if there's an issue, send it to the person who knows about emotional well-being. It should be all teachers in the school should understand that connection between anxiety and stress and learning and thriving, you know, that they aren't disconnected. And often, you know, poor behaviour is a representation of um, emotional well-being, you know, needing some extra support to that. Those kind of subtle ways that teachers can actually deal with an issue in the classroom can often have really long-term effects on the child. We often say every interaction is an intervention. Just to add to that as well, Colleen, it's uh, there was um, very clear feedback from the schools that they are very much under pressure in terms of a wide range of other things. So it's not so much about the which program or intervention in particular is important. It's allowing that space and time. So think about the practicalities of teachers going to continue professional development um, sessions. That includes um, sub cover for someone else to look after the class. So at a very practical level, a lot of teachers reported to me that they are attending these kind of things in their spare time mm -hmm. and taking them on themselves because there isn't capacity. The other um, issue around the kind of wider staff well-being as well um, that there is no spare time within the curriculum um, for staff to be doing those kind of developmental type activities. Um, so it's not about which program in particular is important. It's about allowing the kind of opportunities within the school day for them to build on those skills, as Celine said. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, in my time on the Education Committee, um, the challenge of accessing CPD um, by teachers uh, has been consistently raised. Um, so it, it's welcome that recommendations support um, that we should be providing this type of CPD to, to teachers, but um, we, we have to address the, the barriers that teachers face to accessing that type of CPD if, if it's going to be delivered. Thank you. Uh, Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Claire and Celine, it's very good to have you with us today. Some very important evidence shared with us, confirming quite a lot of the concerns that we were really very conscious of, but uh, it's very important that we hear some of the finer detail that you've been very kind to share with us. Um, I have a number of points. That, uh, the Chair has touched on a few things that I had jotted down, but uh, I, I just uh, have a bit of concern in relation to uh, a similar framework that has been developed by the Health and Social Care Board. Um, do you think that the two frameworks could lead to confusion, perhaps, or even conflict 
Uh, and is it a good thing for us to have two definitions? Uh, surely one that every surely surely one that everyone could work towards a united way would be much better and have much better outcomes for those involved. Uh, yes, one definition would be helpful. Yes, the system working together would be even more helpful. And just a reminder that, you know, our population is about 1.9 million people here. Yep. Uh, let's not build systems that just uh, support each other. If we start from the child and work outwards, what's best for the child, not what's best for our system. Uh, so, yes, we would encourage all wow. collaboration. Um, however difficult, I acknowledge that sometimes it's not, uh, it's not easy. We're not asking for a quick fix, but we are asking for energy and a bit of pace behind this as a joint issue, a respective health, social care or education. Yeah. Whenever, sorry, whenever we were developing the kind of key recommendations, the other framework that you talk about from the Health and Social Care Board was in development along the same kind of time. We didn't see it at the time. Um, but I know there were crossover in terms of the people involved. Um, from my understanding, the Health and Social Care Board one has a, a service focus. Um, so there are some differences, but we have said throughout the process, um, in the absence of us actually knowing what the Health and Social Care Board um, framework was addressing, that there very much had to be crossover. So the team were aware of that and are still aware of the need for connections. And have there been any conversations with the Health and Social Care Board in relation to the ongoing work that they have been doing uh, to ensure that uh, where possible is are on the one page to ensure that confusion um, is avoided? Uh, because if we have two uh, separate directions coming out of this, it, it would cause all sorts of difficulty and would undo the undoubtedly great amount of work that has been done, I have no doubt, by yourselves and by the, the Health and Social Care Board, but it's important that we have one clear uh, uh, course of direction uh, from this. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will be a mess. Com completely agree. And I suppose from our viewpoint, you know, we're an independent organisation, so yeah. these conversations may be happening. Uh, we certainly aren't involved in them, so that might be a question for the Health Care Board or for the Permanent Secretary of Department of Education when he comes before you today? Yeah, that, that's something uh, certainly that, that uh, we'll chase up today um, because it, it, it just makes no sense that uh, they, they may end up with mm -hmm. uh, today. So. Uh, just just a, an, another point, of, I know that much of the support being offered to children and young people today is largely being funded from within school budgets. Um, budgets that have no allowance for such support and have been shared with me and other members of this committee and indeed MLAs from their own respective constituencies. Uh, do you believe that, that there should be a dedicated new funding for this to support our children? And do you believe it would be best done by upskilled teachers who would take these duties on in addition to their teaching or should dedicated staff be appointed and further I am thinking of this especially in the context of supporting parents as well as children and I am also curious to know if you believe that this uh, is the arena schools should increasingly be thrust into or should other services be brought in uh, to fill that void uh, you'll, you'll be aware this is a big big issue at the minute and, and teachers have become all things to children yeah. uh, it has uh, caused all sorts of particularly if there's a vulnerable child in the classroom of 30 and the attention of the teacher automatically goes to that child. Um, equally, there's no extra resources within the school budget, which is putting huge re restrictions on the ability to provide the necessary well-being support for those children. When we did uh, the case studies uh, out, in, out of schools, you could see that some schools had responded by using their own budget, but also by uh, capturing other budgets, so community and voluntary sector, so big organisations like NSPCC or Bernardo's, etc., or expert children would be providing support in schools and some local-based community organisations as well. So there are, mm -hmm. I suppose, clever ways of getting support yeah. into schools that does not use the school budget. Uh, do I think this is be, should be thrust onto schools? Schools are already in the midst of this. They, they have it. 
in their classrooms every day and they have it on the other side of their screens now during this COVID-19 time. So they're there already. I suppose mm. the question is how do we respond and support schools? And I do not think it is just the teacher's responsibility. I think the teacher is a key linchpin. I think the teacher plays a really crucial role but yeah. they should be able to then, as Claire said, screen, just even understand some of the kind of key, um, you know, uh, indicators, you know, that that's not good, that child is acting up, there's something wrong there, they're being a bit quiet or whatever, and then be able to look at a menu of support. Well, what, what could I do with that child? Or, oh, interestingly, in my community setting, here's a incredible years program here's another program that already exists so it is much more about understanding that the school is more than a set of four walls and that connection between parents and community is really really important so mm -hmm. i would hate for schools to think this is their problem to solve alone because that would be absolutely the opposite of what we should be trying to achieve here and i think that's yeah. unfair on teachers who as you've rightly said already have lots and lots and lots to be doing but i think yeah. teachers should appreciate the kind of connection the signposting the understanding of where their role starts and ends some clarity around that all of that would be really helpful i think in the school environment you know what's best for the child is that the child uh, is gets the help that they need at the time they need mm -hmm. often it's too late and what we want to do is make sure it's really uh, much earlier in the child's life. And that's where the rest comes in. You know, for me personally, yeah. the role of parents and curs and family is often missed from this debate. You know, it's often the missing element. And, you know, anything I've seen coming out from the Department of Education on a, on a draft framework, whatever, I've had to go back and say, where are the parents? And if you imagine a parent's life at the moment with the children, well, now we're school holidays, but up until now we had children at home, you were doing schooling at home as much as you could, but also your connection was the media where you were being told constantly about catching up, about lost learning, about what your children are missing out of. The media weren't telling us about how wonderful it is to have yeah. time with your children to play, to actually discuss what's happening at the minute, to think about emotional health. So for me, that, that's the connection that's completely mm -hmm. missing. Trying to reach out to parents and say, actually, also you need to be assured that your emotional health of a child is absolutely paramount. Yeah, and, and just to, to supplement, should, should, should some screen be preschool? Um, emotional mental health starts from when the maternity ward it starts okay, with yeah. that relationship with the mum, starts with the nurturing, starts with the bonding. You know, so infant mental health is really important. We we have an infant mental health framework in Northern Ireland, okay. interestingly. So I think this framework should lead on straight from that. What happens yeah. each two onwards? You know, uh, sorry, the example that I mentioned earlier as part of the early intervention transformation yeah. program um, was a pilot program that built in um, one of the, the kind of three-year review that health visitors do um, as part of the Healthy Child program. Um, yeah. So the, the pilot program was to integrate that within the preschool setting so that the health visitor goes into the preschool setting and sees each child and carries out the social and emotional part of the ages and stages questionnaire, which is a screening questionnaire and to look for early kind of social and emotional developmental issues. And um, so that that was developed as a direct response to children are arriving in school and um, yeah. not ready for school and with those issues. So the screening stage has to be early enough to actually identify and intervene. Okay. Uh, and Chair, uh, you know, just a very you know, important point, Chair, if you just indulge me for a brief second. And I do appreciate, Claire and Celine, your answers so far, because it is an important uh, debate. Various reports have presented us with figures, uh, and you'll be aware of them. 45,000 children in Northern Ireland have mental health problems, and more than one in five pupils are suffering significant mental health problems by the time they are 18. A very, very, very worrying number, and we're seeing this more and more. 
do you believe that cur the current situation we face is as stark as this? Uh, and if so, the past strategies failed to protect these young people. Do you believe that the Department of Health needs to play a much greater role in meeting the needs here? Uh, and as an MLA for West Toronto Rural Constituency, uh, there's very few months that pass that we don't hear of the loss of life of, of young people uh, below the age of 18, up to 18 and beyond it. Uh, and a lot of it is because the necessary intervention wasn't made at the earliest possible stages. So just in relation to that figure, 45,000 children in NA, huge number, very, very worrying and increasing. Uh, uh, we need, uh, I'm just wondering what you think about those, those points. Those particular statistics that you quote also are potentially quite old, and that's one of the big issues that we don't know yeah. the actual scale of the well-being issues. So we know those kind of key figures, the self-harm presentation, the suicide rates, but we don't know anything about the well-being kind of before that stage. So that yeah. we, I can't personally answer that because we, we don't know enough about it. Yeah. I think the Children's Commissioner report, still waiting, was you know, really welcomed by everyone. Um, there is an action plan associated with all those recommendations. But again, the, the question is about pace. You know, the, those, the, those children, since, even since we wrote our report last year, though, those children are now two years older. What's happened during those two years? You know, the babies that have been born during COVID-19 who, you know, haven't had that connection with a wider family because of the isolation, etc. You know, the children who have for the past six months may not have any, any contact with the outside world, you know, because they're not going to school. So I don't anticipate it getting better. Okay. And I think so, so is it your view, to close this off, is it your view, is, is it your view that the 45,000 figure is significantly higher? And uh, that is the case uh, 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 because of COVID as well, because these children are out of school, they're from vulnerable backgrounds. Uh, you know, do you believe that figure is significantly higher than 45,000 children now? And has the COVID-19 pandemic fed into those increases in mental health in young people? As Claire says, we don't know. Uh, we'd love to say we, we'd love to say it isn't, but we don't know, and that that's the issue. Um, we we do know that the impact of COVID nineteen. Uh, there's no doubt that it's going to be increasing stress and anxiety in children, young people. Goodness, it's increased increased stress and anxiety in adults. So why wouldn't it be stressful on, on children, young people? Uh, but as I say, that recent guidance from DE has one or two lines in it. Uh, so there's acknowledgement from our department that this will be an issue when, when schools reopen. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Robbie Butler, Thank MLA. Robbie? Yep. I think you're on mute, are you? No, we can't hear him. We can't hear you for some you can, reason. You can hear me now, can you? Can't you? Go ahead. Thank I you, think that was a ploy. Is that a ploy, Robbie? No, <laughs> well, most definitely not. We're on, we're on, we're on the, the ground that I like to be on now, guys. As you probably probably know, um, I've referenced your report on a number of occasions because of what I find with it was it was probably one of the bravest uh, and most honest um, uh, reports about mental health because what it does is it doesn't um, it separates the emotional well-being part um, from mental health and that's incredibly important and i hear a lot of commentary from people on mental health where they don't and the focus is on the intervention mm -hmm. and right when I mean, we do need intervention there's some good interventions there and you have picked up um on a number of programs uh, that are spread across northern Ireland. there's some elements of good practice but i think this report gives us some hope because it helps us to refocus and it tackles some of the issues that we need to speak about so uh, I mean, if you've been tuning into any of the uh, education committee debates, you will already know that this is a priority of the committee. And I thank the other members for for, for that because we're we are collegiate in, in our approach to this. Um, for me, one of the most important things that you guys have, and you've you've talked about it today um, is the partnership between schools uh, and parents, mm -hmm. because. Um, why schools are probably the most equitable place for all pupils to be, to avail of education and support. When they go out the gates and they go back into the homes that they live in, 
and what we do about um, mental health that some of those circumstances and those sad circumstances whether it's social deprivation whether it's addiction whether whatever it is uh, and, and parents need that support too and it has to be that um, that, that that holistic view of the child and, and you use this to start sorry for rambling here by the way but this is just this is my thing we're talking about whole school whole child the only thing and I've said this to the department and, and the education authority we need to finish that sentence out whole school whole child every child because there are pressures on our um head teachers, budgetary pressures as Daniel has picked out. And we go for the whole school, we get that, we get the whole child and, and very often we're going to be focused in on those different aspects that education has to provide. But sometimes children get missed um, because either they're too quiet or they um, or they just tick along nicely and it's hard to pick up on the cues when you've got big classes. So just going to fire that out there if you, if, if you can. You may not be able to put it in as an addendum to the document, but I would like to see us talking about whole school whole child, every child, because that allows us then to, to bring in the children with special education needs, those with a learning disability and so on, and not have them as an added yes. part of the conversation. Um, because we do know that uh, poor mental health and that, that emotional resilience is even more compounded with the children with, with, with different, different needs. Um, guys, so I'm not going to ramble much more. I'm just going to pick out a couple of wee things and maybe ask you about that. Um, so in terms of your challenges and the challenges to get this right, um, I think the top four were funding, practitioner knowledge, um, engaging with parents, and the availability and provision of what is best practice. Now, I, I picked up earlier there, was about, there were more than 40 programs and approaches that you guys had identified. And why do you think there needs to be a flexibility? I get that. Surely there's best practice. Surely there's some there's some elements of best practice, some that work better than others. Is there any work being done to try and narrow it down uh, into programs that, that provide better value um, and that, that work and that still allow a level of flexibility which picks up on the different pressures that schools are, are, are faced with? Claire will probably come in on that one, particularly yeah. around any systemic reviews that have been done around evidence-based programs. Yeah, there. I mean, there there are a range of um, a, a systematic review is probably the the best kind of evidence to look for that does a, a kind of really robust summary of all of the programs that are available. So there absolutely are um, reviews that will point to. Um, what works. There are individual kind of pieces of research on many of those. So the Roots of Empathy program, for example, there's been a local evaluation carried out on that. Um, there's been some evaluation in terms of the nurture groups. Um, there's been evaluations of lots of those different programs. A couple of issues with that. So evaluations, um, those kind of big, robust pieces of research quite often are carried out in America, for example, or in a different country and aren't directly transferable. Um, so while absolutely we could start to narrow down um, which ones are going to work best, um, the kind of local context is always really important and what's going to be needed for one school isn't necessarily what's going to be needed for another school. Um, so it, I don't think there's a right and wrong answer to that. There's also an issue around what are the key elements and how are they actually delivered. And if schools, um, if we say all schools are going to do one specific program, it's how each of those schools actually implements the program that's going to be the issue. Um, if they don't follow the instructions exactly, if it's got a, a manual or a kind of guideline for the program, they don't follow it exactly. If they aren't properly trained, if they aren't properly qualified to deliver it, then the impact of it is going to vary massively. So there are so many more issues beyond the which one or two programs are actually going to work best. Yeah, no, I would accept that. I think that the pressures exist similarly for the ability to choose a programme that may or may not suit and the, the attitude of the school towards emotional uh, well-being and, and mental health because that varies greatly. So I think there needs to be some structure and some framework which hopefully the document in, in December um, will, will give us. That's what, yeah. what we recommended was that there's a kind of selection, a choice of here's the top, you know, um, selection of programs 
here's what they're specifically good at or here's what they're specifically targeted at. Now the schools have flexibility to choose from those, but some okay. kind of yes. menu of, of the most important. No, that, 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 that's that's really that's actually really really useful because um, uh, there is a there's a, a very attitude um, uh, and and different as you say different schools are faced with different problems and need the flexibility but there needs to be something I think in about the I, I would actually go as far as to say that it should there should be something in the curriculum which should be well being focused as well um, because in the preventative piece um, in the preventative piece I think it's it's just going to be an, an ongoing. Um, issue and it was good to see that you guys had picked up and I think Dan had picked up on it again he picked up on most things is that the, the report actually indicates that our children today perhaps are in some ways less resilient to, to, to some things but they are faced with many different pressures social media being one of them that, that 24-7 um, access to you know to where you be bullied or, or, or all of those mm -hmm. all, all of those things just um, I've got, got one question because I think this is probably one of the most important in terms of that partnership between schools and parents um, and those, those parental teacher relationships. What is have you got any idea about the best way, best, best methodology, or how how we tackle that? Because if we don't get a partnership and we don't get a constructive partnership, then we will con consistently be be far fighting. I think. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we both take an end breath because me and Claire both, <laughs> both be quite yeah. passionate about this subject area. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that really I, I, is one of the areas that the, the schools have reported they struggle on. Yeah. Um, and when they run, say, a parents' evening, it's the parents who don't necessarily need to hear the information who come every time. And um, it's the parents who need to know who they struggle with. Yeah. So it, it is a massive and ongoing struggle for schools. I do think, but Robbie, there's work to be done to support schools again in innovative uh, solutions to that. Uh, so um, during this time of COVID-19, we're all on the other side of a screen. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting that some schools would have told us that they've got more parental engagement now than ever? Yeah. Because strangely enough, parents are feeling more able to speak on the other side of a screen, on a Zoom or whatever, than actually go through those school gates. Okay, now that might be because, you know, that they're really welcoming the school in or they're more concerned because the children are home more or may just be that the actual environment is a bit more friendly. They're sitting on their own sofa. So yeah. I think there's lots to be learned from lockdown. Not, let's yeah. not lose that, you know, and even the use of, you know, Facebook groups and WhatsApp groups and things like that. Again, it's back to our imposing our adult solutions on these, you know, <laughs> holding a parents' evening at six o'clock and then wondering why parents can't attend. When A, they're probably making dinner, B, they're probably exhausted, and C, you know, the children to mind, you know. So there's... There's obvious reasons why things haven't worked. And then there's other ways that we can look at it, not just say, we tried it, therefore, let's stop trying it. You know, I think all schools at the minute uh, have really seen the benefit of when they've had those strong parental relationships that existed that they can call on during times like this. And maybe going forth in our new school year, that actually that parent engagement will be really well up there in terms of the priorities for the school. You know, mm. And also from the parental side, I think I really need to keep in touch with the school more to know what's happening. Sure. You know, it is, it is a two-way street. Well, I'm just going to finish on this, Chair, if you don't mind. It's not a question. I'm just going to thank you both for that because I think I tried to say a word in the chamber last week and made a fool of myself. It was catastrophization. And when we're dealing with, when we're dealing with mental health, and, we're, and, 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 and this is a challenge for everybody, COVID does present problems, right? But let's not catastrophize every part of it because there is learning out of this. And you picked up on one child being mulling over in my head. It's really useful that in how we engage the parents. And, I'll just, I'll, and, and if you can imagine parents who might want to say something to a teacher to tell, inform them of something, how do you do that face-to-face -face in the same room? I think it would be a lot easier if you're in a, a little private chat room online or something, and perhaps there's maybe those relationships, and we could use the learning, as you've said, Celine, um, with regard to what we've learned out of COVID. So, guys, thank you so much, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. And Thanks, just to, to, add, to add something to that as well, um, with a direct interest in it, um, in addition to the interface with school, quite a lot of our children and young people will interface with sports groups, and other types of clubs and organisations as well. It's probably important that in, in our effort to equip teachers and parents to respond adequately to the promotion of positive emotional health and well-being, that we make sure our 
our sports and clubs sectors mm -hmm. are included in that work as well. But I'll, I'll bring in um, Morris, Morris Bradley, in the It's Morris there. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Morris, we can't hear you. Yeah, Morris, we can't. We can't hear you at the moment. Morris, are you there? I'll try again. Sorry, sorry. There you are. Go ahead, Morris. Thank you. The disadvantage of working from your office is people knock the door and want in. Uh, <laughs> And if you, if you go into the back office and hide, they say, oh, the office is open, but he's never in it. <laughs> go ahead. There. So, sorry, apologies. Yeah, uh, my question, and thank you very much, uh, Claire and Celine, for your presentation so far, and also to the other members of the committee for some very, very good questions and some very, very, uh, I think, some explanations of what actually is happening. But my, my line is on sport, and I was wondering uh, the relationships between young children, primary school and post-primary school, especially post-primary school, and sporting clubs, outside sporting clubs, not everybody can take part in uh, a team sport. But is there an opportunity to investigate out-of-school activities, say gymnastics, athletics, rowing, karate, archery, equestrian, anything you've got there to try and encourage people to take part in sport, and not just team sports, but any sport, and they may find a sport that they might excel in. Mm. So I wonder what, what do you think sport plays in the emotional well-being of the uh, development of children? If, oh, well. if, sorry, if, sorry, Celine, just to, just to say that in the research, that was a really interesting discussion. Um, and one of the things that we find that in schools, it's not necessarily those kind of organized well-being type programs or activities that work, but actually the kind of um, after school clubs and it's not so sport absolutely um, but also music and art and other kind of activities as well so the outside of the academic um, world but still happening within school um, are all really really important and really supportive in terms of emotional well-being and um, so so absolutely agree with you yeah. And of course, our um, extended schools funding that we used to have that is now, I think, down to a trickle, if not stopped completely, really encouraged those links outside the school, you know, and uh, I know some great examples where schools use that funding even to transport the children to sporting activities or get uh, sports coaches into schools, you know, because they didn't have to use their own budget, they could use extended schools budget, and all of those activities have really positive positive impact on emotional health. You know, children do feel much better if they're engaged in those activities. There's absolutely no doubt. The evidence is very clear there. So if we could encourage any more of those kind of direct linkages, because uh, they all go on in the community, it would just be great if we could legitimise that link with the school more and make that more routine rather than relying on the children, young people to go and seek them out. There's, there's definitely more we could do in that area. Yeah, and I do find whenever young children become involved in sport, that the parents become involved. Yes. Uh, they, they take them to the sport, they wait for them, they watch them. It's, so, it's definitely one that I would like to see and it just into the, the curriculum anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you can see even in, um, in Sport NI, they've done a, a, a programme with NSPCC around uh, anti-bullying practice in sport as well, which is really good because it shines a light on that importance uh, when children are involved in sporting activities, that they have those positive, supportive relationships too. And that, is not, that acceptable behaviour is really clear. So that's a, that's a really good linkage. And when we've seen that working well in sporting clubs, I mean, sporting clubs then as well kind of understand their role in that child's life. It's not always about scoring the goal. It's about building that resilience and the self-esteem and the team spirit and all of that. And that all helps with feeling good and building your own resilience. It's not about winning. It's about taking part. And I always that's, think... That's the theory. Healthy that's the theory. Yeah. A healthy, healthy body develops a healthy mind. Absolutely. Uh, there's another great line we need to put in that report. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Morris. Catherine Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chair, and hello, Celine and Claire. Hello, How are you? Hello. 
Thanks so much for your presentation today and well done on such an informative and comprehensive study. Um, Claire, you mentioned early year screening um, and the absence of it. We are continually told that the first 1,000 days of a child's life are paramount. So I would be expecting um, the framework to have a particular focus on this um, come September. Um, I believe that this is a huge opportunity um, for us to support our children from their first days and ensure early intervention when needed. We can see Sure Start carrying out some of that um, in some areas across the north, but it's unfortunately not every child um, has access to it. And um, the research has shown less resilience amongst our younger children. But what kind of interventions do you see as most effective in encouraging well-being amongst the very young? Again, the, so you'll, you'll be familiar with the infant mental health framework from the Public Health Agency. So this framework we envision very much needs to reflect and link to all of those other things. So the infant mental health framework um, suggests the need for that kind of evidence in terms of the early years development and the impact on social and emotional learning. Um, to be kind of more widely available, but also a focus on workforce development. Um, so all of those people working in health and education, but in early years, so preschool teachers, preschool leaders, um, all of those kind of practitioners who are in contact need to have the, the um, knowledge and the, the training in terms of infant mental health and the impacts and how to support um, and then service development is the third stream of that infant mental health framework. And that focuses on things like um, the Incredible Years program, which um, NCB have a role in coordinating across Northern Ireland um, and some other specific um, programs such as the Solihull approach. Um, but there was also lots of information there in terms of building social and emotional learning and building the whole theory behind that into parental education, antenatal care, and um, right across that area. So that whole kind of infant mental health framework deals with all of that. And this framework absolutely has to link to that and then pick up where it leaves off, but all interconnected. Yeah, and I suppose another positive note is that when uh, the early intervention transformation program was being developed and it considered the getting ready for baby program uh, which is now delivered in, in some health trusts and that really uh, you know kind of combined the antenatal care the clinical practice with, that, with also the emotional care so because uh, they find that mothers are more likely to go to their appointment if it was to find out something about the delivery or the labour but if you say to them come and find out how to nurture and build bonds with your baby and develop emotional health they may have thought we don't need to know that so kind of getting ready for baby combines both of those elements and really tries to prepare mums and uh, dads and, and the, the wider family for the baby's arrival now that I suppose the, the missing link in Northern Ireland is what happens then if you uh, notice any anxiety or stress or lack of bonding with your baby uh, when the child arrives. And, you know, we've mentioned postcode lottery already. So we know that in the Southeastern Health Trust, they have a, you know, a really uh, strong program for infant mental health called the ABC program, where parents can, can go and immediately be referred from a very young age to their baby and have, you know, really, you know, preventative support, but also services in terms of, you know, child psychotherapy if needed. And that means that, you know, those kind of issues can be addressed really early on, but that's not in all health trusts. So, you know, if you really want a good service, you have to move uh, move to that health trust and that really shouldn't be the way it is. So really that infant mental health framework is trying to have consistent practice across Northern Ireland and make sure that those important 1001 days, that parents understand that and practitioners 
and then know what they can do as individuals to support. Sorry, that was my cat. <laughs> to, to, to support the, the baby during those those early days. But you're absolutely right, Catherine. It starts from the maternity ward. Oh. Sorry, I just said that uh, Robin Newton's dog now has a rival. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Catherine. Sorry, Robin. The cat just fell off the sofa, obviously having a good dream. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for that, Claire and Celine. And, and just on, on one last point, um, how lastly do you think that the department will need to ensure there's a focus on how our children and young people have been affected by COVID-19 and in particular our children, children with special educational needs? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we know this is happening. Let's not ignore it. What is our civic recovery plan going to be? Um, funny, I wrote an article the other day talking about getting real about recovery. Uh, you know, we know that children are going to feel more anxious and stressed. We know that children with special educational needs, you know, may have suffered even more during this, this period. Uh, so we need to be really clear about what we're going to do as a result. Let's not sleepwalk into a bigger issue come August, September and wonder why we have even more issues in our school environment. We should absolutely be using every minute to think about what we can actually set in place to support those children on the return. Thanks a million. That's me, Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Justin? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Celine and Claire. Um, excellent presentation, excellent evidence, and uh, very, very important uh, information you've shared with us all. And thanks to all the, the committee members also for their very good questions. A um, number of things here. I think a really positive uh, piece of what you guys are doing, your, your raison d'etre, is United for a better childhood, and that's incredibly powerful. And I commend you for that. And it's obvious that you're, obvious that you're both very passionate about that. I think everybody in this committee will, will endeavour to support you in every way we can. Um, in terms of the issues that you're, you're identifying for children and young people, um, self-esteem issues, anxiety, bullying, stress, self-harm, poverty, which is very, very concerning that such a large proportion of children are experiencing poverty. In this day and age, and it's 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 shameful. It's shameful. What are we doing? What what is our government been doing? It's shameful to think that we've had three years of absence of government, and meanwhile, a quarter of the children in our society are in poverty. It is shameful. We should be disgusted by ourselves. Absolutely disgusted by ourselves. Um, the new term I found was interesting. The FOMO, um, fear of missing out. I just I thought that was interesting um, terminology. For children, and I suppose that's something that every age group experiences, and it's something that's prevalent in society as a whole. Um, you're talking about firefighting versus um, investing just strategically. Um, you've mentioned that every interaction is an intervention, and the culture of well-being must be underpinned by appropriate strategies and actions. Now, I'm, I'm leading in here to an important issue that has already been touched on. I've, I've been for a long time a, a strong advocate for physical activity and sport, uh, especially amongst young people, because I know how much of an important impact it's had in my life personally, and I know how much of an impact it's had in my, my, my teammates' lives and on the lives of so many people that I know and I'm involved with. And Morris has touched on it already very importantly. So, and um, I want to tell you this as well. You know, we've, we talk about mental health, we talk about emotional well-being, and Robbie has touched on it a little bit. And these are often just compartmentalised as issues. Mm -hmm. how, how important a role can sport and physical activity play in addressing the challenges that children and young people and all age groups face in terms of their mental health and, and emotional well-being? And the, the, I, I tell, you also said that because of the cuts that are being made by the education department relating to the curriculum sports program, I also say it because children have been inactive for an extended period now because of lockdown. Some have been out in the country and have open spaces and have been very active, and that's been fantastic, but others haven't had that opportunity. So I'm, I'm concerned about the deficit and the physical activity for young people and that the knock-on effects of that for their emotional well-being and for their mental well-being are extraordinary. So... 
Um, and I've, I've become familiar as well with an organization over recent months and years, an organization called Healthy Kids, whose mission is a, a, a holistic health program created to allow every citizen to achieve their best possible state of well-being. And they're, they're passionate about helping kids of all levels get involved in sport, buddy up with somebody at their level and become more active and build their self, emotional and, and uh mental well-being to, to be stronger and it involves the parents and the teachers and you talked about involving parents and teachers and it doesn't put too much more onus on teachers who are already overloaded so how much more important is that we actively use interactions as an intervention with policies and um strategies that are built into our education program that actually address the issues and we'll just talk about and address them actively and what better way than through sport. I, I couldn't agree more, Justin, and I have to say it is one of those things that if schools do it routinely, and it depends on your definition of sport as well, sometimes people can get turned off thinking, well, I don't play a sport, but actually just doing the mile a day around the schoolyard, yeah. and there's some very small uh, kind of interventions that are all, that when schools pick them up, they often wonder why we didn't do this before. And, you know, there's an outdoor schools program as well. Some of our uh, sure starts do 90% of their class outside, you know, in the sand pit, etc. So I, I think a lot of this is happening in, in schools where we see really positive mental health. We can really see the benefits. It is about just being, um, I suppose, more explicit about that in our curriculum where we place sport and outdoor activity and how important we understand it. I think a good emotional health and well-being framework could position that uh, finding, you know, about the role of sport and activity really, you know, in the center as well, along with relationships and parents, you know, so schools really get it and say this isn't an, uh, this isn't an added bonus of being a school. This should be absolutely core to our activity. You know, recently we ran a webinar with um, partners and play board in Northern Ireland, all about the, you know, we talked about the importance of play, talked about the impact of that on children, talked about children when they come back after COVID-19, how they should be able to interact and play and, you know, do some physical activity, not just set them at desks immediately to do the catch up. Uh, so no, I couldn't agree more and I'm sure all the evidence would support that finding um, that, that sport has a really positive impact on well-being. And just I think on that. something, sorry, is something that Celine said there about um, being sure that you can appeal to everybody. So when I was at school many years ago, it was hockey or rugby and that was it. And I was not in any way into it. Um, whereas now in some of the schools I was in, they have after school clubs in like hip hop dance, all kinds of kind of wild things that it's really important that schools understand why they're doing it and that they can actually try and appeal to the, all of the people so that there's something for everybody that the focus just isn't on those kind of traditional organized sports, but there's so many other things that are all physical activity but they're fun in whatever way appeals to the children. Yeah, that's, I, I wasn't I wasn't speaking specifically about the organised sports, so I was talking about, yeah. you know, active, just yeah. activity in the schoolyard. Yeah, or, or, absolutely. Um, and really mild, as you mentioned, Celine. And I yeah. did get a message from Kieran Kearney actually this morning from the, the NA Sports Forum saying that £320 million, uh, premium has been committed by the Education Secretary, so hopefully there will be a barred consequential for over here, which could have a huge, yeah. huge impact in terms of the return to uh, school for children and something that we actively support, and I hope you guys will as well. So thank you very much for your evidence. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, locating a, a, a previous Assembly motion, I think, from 2016, um, which was passed that called on the Minister for Education to improve the monitoring and reporting of physical education accessed mm -hmm. by primary pupils in particular and to issue a public consultation on the introduction of a statutory obligation on schools to facilitate an appropriate minimum amount of physical education hours per week for primary school pupils. So um, something that we can definitely return to as a as a committee. Um, 
Celine, Claire, thank you so much indeed for your time with us today. Um, as many of the members have said, we, we could have gone into the issues in much more detail um, than time allowed us. And we hope that we can maintain contact with you uh, as we seek to ensure that the emotional health and wellbeing framework is brought forward in a quality and timely way. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, members. Much. Uh, really appreciated that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. All the best. Bye bye. There you go. Okay, members. Uh, Clark, do you want to summarise actions? Yeah. Thanks, Chair. So, um, if the broadcasting bring all the members back into the spotlight, brilliant. Um, so, I think maybe the committee wants to write again to the department, just asking about the progress on the emotional health and wellbeing framework, and um, also the linkage to the health and social care board framework. Now, there is a reference. Um, to this in the SIP rep, uh, which I'll point out to you later. But anyway, I think you're, you're wanting to know where the progress is, where they are with this. Also, perhaps asking the department whether they're considering developing a well-being measure for schools, so that the way in which schools are uh, assessed would just be in terms of um, examination performance. Uh, then also perhaps asking them about um, screening in the early years and whether they're going to learn the lessons from the early intervention transformation program where there was screening in the early years for emotional issues and then also perhaps asking how the department is going to embed the safeguarding board's trauma-informed culture program how it's going to embed that in schools and then additionally um, asking um, how the new framework will uh, support parents to engage and indeed other groups like the sporting groups we just mentioned and then well, uh, to, to maybe ask uh, whether the emotional health and wellbeing framework will you know, set out very clearly the important role for sport in addressing um, emotional health and wellbeing issues. Chairperson, anything else? That's not the word, sorry, Chair. It's, it's not just sport. I think that's a, that's a mistake being made. It's not you know it's not formal sport. This is a fit, like physical, physical activity. Act yeah. Formal sport. Really good. Yep. Physical activity. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, members contend if we if we specifically seek update from the department um, with regards to its response to that motion from eleventh of October twenty sixteen that was passed by the assembly. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Okay. Content, Clark. Really good. Yes, yeah. thanks, Chair. Okay. Agenda item six then, Clark, is our uh, brief uh, closed session in relation to the post primary transfer survey. Yeah, just to agree some. Do you want to seek the committee's medicine? agreement to go to? Yeah, close. members content just to go to closed session briefly to uh, agree work on the survey. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Sorry. You need to get the broadcast and to bring them in first. That's okay. Do you want to push the button? That's okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. So we're back. Okay. Okay, members, we're returning to agenda item seven, which is our oral briefing from the Department of Education on COVID-19. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to keep me in the spotlight function, uh, remove all other members, and to add the Permanent Secretary? and Deputy Permanent Secretary, and I believe the Minister for Education as well. Um, can I ask members to note in your meeting packs a briefing paper from the committee clerk, including a table showing the current status of the committee's COVID correspondence at page 343 and other COVID-related correspondence from page uh, 360 to 380, including departmental response on holiday hunger, Responses from a number of schools with regards to post-primary transfer. A further paper from Unite on issues affecting childminders. A copy of a renewal notice relating to the Coronavirus Act. And a COVID-19 report by Pivotal. And I also ask members to note table items which include an index of tabled items at page 8. An updated uh, situation report from the Department of Education at page 9. Information from the Department of Education on the restart budget, in particular on broadband access and related correspondence from OMA Learning Community at page 49. Department of Education correspondence responding to a concerned parent re childcare restart issues. Correspondence from another concerned parent regards virus testing of children in childcare. A copy of the uh, Ulster University 
Parent Kind survey on homeschooling at page 64 and a copy of corresponds to the Minister from Solace on the impact of COVID-19. Uh, Minister, Permanent Secretary, Deputy Permanent Secretary, you're, you're very welcome to the committee today. Um, and uh, can I ask uh, you if you uh, wish to make your opening remarks? Thank you. Hello, Hello Chair. Sorry, I, didn't, I, I asked you just in terms of opening remarks. Yeah, I mean, I suppose just, uh, I don't know what like the three musketeers or the three stooges or whatever you want to, to call us are in front of you again today in relation to that. I suppose just want to touch on a few items. Um, obviously, the main focus has been on uh, restart. And again, I would reiterate, which I think would be, I think it's becoming increasingly likely as time moves on uh, that we'll be in a position that in terms of the position uh, to seek sort of uh, an executive approval for uh, a shift so that we can move to a situation that across the board, everybody would do five days a week um, within that. That obviously has to be judged a little bit closer to the time, but I think that that is, that is moving. Mention is supposed to be made in particular of, of finance, and I suppose there's maybe been a little bit of um, headlines maybe didn't reflect the full reality. I suppose in terms of finance, we're making the point that there is the, the budget is there from the point of view of the department. We have got, uh, via some of the COVID-related um, issues, particular additions um, in year, as yet, that remains the overall budget. So in that sense, there isn't extra departmental money uh, that the department has. However, we have indicated, I think, also the school that in terms of restart, of reaching day one, if there are costs which are additional, necessary and evidenced, that uh, we will ensure that, that those costs are met. We believe that actually a lot of those will be um, capital in their, their nature, uh, around, for example, um, hand sanitization uh, stations. Uh, there will also presumably be some extra costs in terms of the initial bit on internal cleaning. We believe those, those can largely be met. I think where there's a bigger issue will be not, not what will enable schools simply to reopen on day one, but where there will be a level of, of um, ongoing costs which may be related to COVID. And to that extent, I think, uh, we're working, obviously, with EA in the broader level, but it's undoubtedly the case that if there's going to be additional pressures that are going to be there, then ultimately I think the only way that those can be met in full is with additional support from the uh, executive. Um, we've seen a rollout, um, I think, sort of concluding this week, of some of the additional devices, I think about 3,600 additional IT devices. And indeed, there's work um, that has been reached, particularly work with BT in terms of uh, some of the broadband provision as well. Uh, that, if you like, in terms of the IT devices concludes phase two, but as part of that then is indicated, uh, the department has been procuring an extra 8,000 uh, devices and those will be ready, I think, before the beginning of, of term. Uh, we've also, there has been considerable guidance has been also issued in terms of remote learning and from curriculum support. But again, there's ongoing issues with that. Uh, turning, I suppose, to um, a few issues in relation to SEN and summer provision, uh, obviously in terms of placements, we've been working with the EA, uh, and while there's still considerable work to be done, uh, the numbers, I think the latest figures we've had in terms of the numbers of placements, we indicated last week it had gone down from unplaced children from 285 to 206. It's now down to 141, and we're continuing to work to ensure that it's a place for every child. Um, also, I suppose, in terms of special schools, uh, we're pleased to indicate that, that while the scope may not be as quite as, as wide as it was before, it's a slightly different format given uh, COVID. Normally, there are 21 of the special schools provide uh, summer schemes. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we're now in a position where all 21 will be providing summer schemes uh, this year. Um, also, also, should in terms of the position of continuity of learning and recapture uh, of learning, obviously, we have a continuity of learning group. But in terms of initial action during the summer, we've about 49 or 50 schools have volunteered, uh, which we're providing a level of support to, to do some level of, of um, summer learning recapture. That is an entirely voluntary process, but we're happy to support those who are, are doing that. And there's ongoing work in terms of the larger scheme, because I think it has to be more um, systemic in its nature uh, on that recapture via what we're calling the Engage scheme, um, which will operate during the next academic year. And there's about 11 million of the 12 million pounds of budget that we've got from the morning round will be focused in on that. Um, I suppose then the only other issue just 
there has been again some progress on the childcare issue. Uh, business cases are being worked up. Um, I suppose probably three points to note in relation to that. In the last week, we've signed off on indemnification for uh, childcare facilities because obviously there's a concern for some of them if they were opening. Uh, would they then face the risk of claims going in against them? And it's important that there's that level of reassurance because that will help um, the, the situation. Business service organisation have indicated that they don't have the capacity to um, carry on with the processing side of this, so there'll be an alternative provider will be put in place. But I think particularly the focus, and this will um, enable, if you like, the focus to ensure that there's the expenditure of money. I suppose while the first scheme... Uh, principally aided those who were closed and enabled a number of them to keep their head above water. And a number of other organ of the childcare organisations found it was perhaps easier routes to get um, money through other sources. The, the funding, I think, in terms of and the nature of the scheme, which is at the final stages of, of um, getting ready to, to launch, um, will be very much focused on, on actually reopening and ensuring that the uh, childcare facilities are open. Uh, obviously, allied to that as part of a wider executive childcare recovery side of it, which looks not just to the formal sector, but also I think a range of the easements will have a, a, a role, particularly in terms of childminding and particularly for family and friends to provide that, that as well. So I suppose those are the main, the main points that uh, we've covered. I know there's obviously individual uh, points that I'm sure members will, will want to raise, but we're happy between the three of us to deal with any questions. Thanks, Minister. As you mentioned, concerns regards education restart budget um, ha have been raised in the media today. Can I can I ask a fairly simple question? You know, without prejudice or, or ill intent, what why why did you write to schools to say that there is no additional funding in the education budget to address anticipated pressures if you're now saying that there there is funding? Well, no, that's what. Look, that's what we said within the, the overall budget. The budget is the same in terms of the, the budget side of it. What we, what we also said, and you can, to some extent, there can be lines selectively quoted out of that. But what we said is, is efforts um, are underway with the Education Authority uh, and the schools to quantify that, to, um, to, if you like, come to a view in terms of what, what is needed to provide, I suppose, and also where department will be engaging with DOF. So it's going to be a combination of things. There will be a range of, of issues that, that, as I said, can be capitalised. There will be, I think, where we can see easements. There can be a thing. You know, what we're saying is the overall education budget, is that any different, outside of the specific amounts of money that we've received, is that any different from uh, what was there in April? No, it's not. So there will need to be a level of, of bidding put in. But it would therefore be a level of cocktail uh, approach that will need to be put in place in relation to it. I think, look, I'm, I think part of the thing we're conscious that I think for schools will behave very responsibly. What we didn't want an impression was that simply there was some level of um, open checkbook in terms of what, what could be provided. You know, there will need to be a level of scoping done in connection with this. And also, particularly as we move, um, for example, if there are actions needed in terms of additional premises, I think that's something that can be covered. But what we're saying is actually at, at first instance, look to what you can do from within your cells and then we will be supportive where it is additional and necessary. Okay, so if, if a school forecasts additional expenditure on items such as desks, PPE, uh, cleaning materials, how do, well, they, think, look, how do they go about securing that additional budget? Well, look, well, we'll be doing that. I mean, don't forget, in terms of PPE equipment, I think we'd work with EA to see if, for example, there could be a central stock uh, of supply of that, because I don't think, in the pure sense, would a school be likely to be, largely speaking, simply sourcing its own PPE would be unlikely. That wouldn't be particularly cost effective. Look, we'll be working with schools um, as we, we do that, if there's additional material that, that is required. But, you know, I think at first instance where I think the, the idea, I suppose, is people should be looking to see where they, first of all, can repurpose. So it's where it is additional and uh, where it is necessary. So if you take, let's take an example in terms of PPE, there will be a certain amount that will be, a small amount that will be required in each school. Uh, and I think, to be fair, particularly, say, special schools would probably be in a different category as regards to this. There will be advice and advice that has been given in terms of the circumstances in which PPE is required. But 
One of the things to take an example on it that we've given clear cut advice on the basis of what we've been told medically is uh, with probably very rare exceptions, children, for instance, don't require masks. So if a school thought, well, actually, we think it's very desirable that we have all our children in masks every day now, I think a fairly unusual position for them to take. That's something that wouldn't be necessary. In fact, it's not even something that's, that's advisable. So it, you know, it is where it's necessary, where it's additional, because there will also be that in a general situation, schools will have certain routine costs, which are non-COVID related, which would happen anyway. Again, that will be part of the normal process. Um, and similarly, I think that we would need uh, that if a school is looking for additional expenditure uh, on those things, we'd, we need to work with them to have some level of evidence base. It's not simply a question of a school saying, we need, we need an extra £7,000 and then, you know, just give it to us type of thing. Now, I don't think schools would do that anyway, but uh, we need just to make sure that, that, that it meets those criteria. And we're working with the... I mean, it will also be the case as things are ongoing that, you know, we can make probably a level of assessment as we enter into what might be described as day one. To some extent, I think there will be a level of variability, of course, as we move ahead. Uh, some of those things, I think, if we move to a position where uh, there is a shift towards uh, a slightly more normalised situation, which seems at present, at least that is, that is the direction of travel, will reduce some of those pressures. But I suspect that, that it will be difficult entirely to quantify some of those ongoing issues until we really get into the meat of the position um, in the, the autumn itself. But, we're, you okay. know, we'll work with schools. Allocated for the Engage Numeracy and Literacy Recovery Program. Um, it would be roughly speaking a little bit over 11, 11 million. What we estimate in terms of um, the position is there's been a 12 million pound. I, I should say as well. I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll slightly qualify that in a moment. So 12 million has been allocated in year for sort of call it learning recovery. There are um, the couple of the summer interventions probably between them may end up costing around about 700,000. That'll be both in terms of virtual classroom and uh, support where schools are voluntarily doing some work with, with pupils. The remainder of the budget would go in the in-year process into um, the Engage programme. Now, what is likely to be the case is the overall Engage process will, will cost a bit more than that because uh, you know, that, would, that would take us through to the end of March 2021 and then either through the departmental budget or through um, bidding for next year's, but there is likely, therefore, to be some into the um, the 2021 school year, but the 2020 21-22 uh, financial year. So you would be paying probably um, some additional, a few extra million that would that would go into the April May time. That would be in the 2021-22 budget. So uh, you know, if I'm making a rough estimate, we're still scoping out. You will probably have an overall program that may end up costing, for the sake of argument, about fourteen million. Okay. Okay. And do you, do you have you're, you're speaking in extremely optimistic terms and with regards to uh, a return to more full time school attendance and provision? Do you have a time scale in mind for when uh, full time attendance and provision is likely in schools? Well, Chair, there will have to be judgment, and it's not entirely my call because it will, it will have to be the executive would have to um, endorse this. But if we look at what's happened in other jurisdictions, you know, we've taken a precautionary approach to say that a, an absolute final judgment has got to be made closer to the school year. And I, I think, to be fair, while that would mean a, a shift before we get to the beginning of the school year, I think it would be something that, that teachers, schools, parents and pupils would all, would all welcome. I think we have to make it a judgment probably towards roughly the end of this month, beginning of next month as to where we are, and potentially put um, a, you know, put a slightly amended position slightly to the executive that would enable that to happen. Uh, you know, yes, it, you may call that optimistic. I think it's it's probably now optimistic towards the, the, the realms of realistic. Uh, and I know, for example, uh, I think, uh, I know Scotland, for instance, I think is going to come to a finalised position for openings on the 11th of April, uh, they, 11th of August. I think they are looking to make a finalised position at the end of July as to where they land. Um, other jurisdictions, I think, will also need to do um, their side of things. So, look, I think it would be better if we can reach a point at which it is clear, uh, and this will largely be judged by levels of community transfer, etc. Um, 
if that further alteration can be made, and it should also indicate that 90% of the guidance actually probably applies irrespective of precisely where we are in terms of the COVID side of it. Okay. Um, if that can be done before, before the beginning, then I think that, that should be done. Okay. And is that something that you'd bring a statement to the Assembly on, obviously, if there were any changes um, well, during it, July or August? I, well, I think the only issue in that regard, if there was a change during July, uh, I think where there's a balance to be struck is to try to make sure that um, it is relatively close to the, the start of term so that we're actually able to judge it in those circumstances. I think the only issue would be if it was then into August, obviously I don't think the Assembly would, would actually be sitting during August. I need to check the technicalities on that. I, I understood that the ad hoc committee um, well, can look, be called if, if, look, fairly straightforward. Let me, let me, let me, Chair, let, let me put it this way. If, if there's an issue of recalling the, the ad hoc committee, um, I have no problem with that. I mean, I just... Uh, if, if, it's, if it's purely, if you like, in the normal run of assembly timings, then if it was into August, then it wouldn't be. But again, look, I've, I've, I, look, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. Put it that way, in that regard, at least, not, not, not voluntarily. No, nor are and we. So, so yeah, if, be, you, if you need, I'd be happy. Yeah, yeah, and if you know, if with a, you know, in, in order to be constructive, um, if you need a, an assembly vehicle via which to engage with the assembly on a matter of that importance, we would obviously be glad to facilitate a meeting of this committee to do so as well, Minister. I'm very I'm very happy you're giving me the keys to the ignition in that regard, Chair. But I'll be happy like I'll be happy to work with yourselves and, and the Assembly and whatever uh, and whatever, you know, if things work out that way and if it goes on that particular time scale, then yeah, I'd be more than happy to make a, a statement to the okay. Assembly through ad hoc or okay. through the committee or whatever. Okay. You say um hundred and forty one children with a statement of special educational need are still without a school place for September. Do you know how many of those 141 are children seeking a place in a special school? Yeah, I think the breakdown is there's 106 uh, children in that bit. I think then uh, Maz is created 35 that are seeking units within mainstream side of it. So there's ongoing work. I mean, obviously, from that point of view, the operational responsibility lies with the EA, but we're working with them to assist them uh, within that. And obviously... That has meant that the numbers have, have halved. That's out of, I think, a total of overall of 2,345. But obviously, uh, while there's always be some level of... Um, the the, the match-up is never perfect in that regard. Obviously, if we've got 141, it's still 141 too many, but at least yeah. we've been able to have that in the space of a fortnight. So, so sorry, you said 106 um, yeah, children I think, still I think to the, be placed in special break, schools, yeah? Yeah, the, the breakdown the breakdown is I think 106 in special schools and 35 that would be within units or you know more or less mainstream um, side of it. I think is the breakdown. I, are you concerned that any of those 106 will not have places in September, Minister? Well, look, I'm I'm concerned about the opportunities and the um, responsibility that that is there in terms of that. Uh, I think. Uh, you know, I, sincerely, I think we will be working to try to make sure that every every child is is placed within that. You know, barring, you know, you can't rule out in an individual case you may get a situation where, for instance, you may get a particular set of circumstances where, as occasionally happens, a family, and this can also happen outside of, of special educational needs, where uh, a family also on the basis of it simply refuses refuses a place where there's one that, that is available to them because they have their heart set on a particular place. And that's the same also, I think, with within mainstream placements. But I think we'll be making sure that there will be a place at least made available to every every child. And I think that's obviously a key uh, it's obviously a key focus as we move ahead. As I said, the placements will be with, with EA, but we'll be working with them to try and make sure that, that happens. Okay. So so you said there so you're you're confident that all one hundred and six of those children will be offered a special schools place for September. That cert that certainly is the, the hope that we're trying to uh, achieve in, in relation to it. As I said, we're working with EA or the people who will be doing the operational side of it. But look, I think it's imperative that we get a situation where children are found places okay. on that basis. Okay. You okay. know, there's been a range of, range of measures to be done to, to do that. But whatever will need to be happen, you know, will happen. Okay. Uh, Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Minister Derek and John. 
um, this morning again. Minister, I just wanted to go back on uh, the chair there in relation to the, the budget, the restart, the stuff in the media this morning. Um, so uh, is it that the department then is working on the assumption of a full return? And is that why a budget hasn't been assigned or bid for? Uh, and has this work been left to August to see? I, I take into account we're in a very full, fluid situation. It's difficult no, at this stage no, to no, say that's, what that's, that's in September. No, that's that's not the case. I think the opportunities in terms of funding, in terms, but would probably be, I suspect, in terms of maybe via additional COVID funding, maybe by way of the vehicle that, that may be used would be the next monitoring round that would be used. No, look, I think it's just the sheer amount where there's there is, uh, and I suppose to be fair, schools ourselves, everybody is trying to scope out precisely what will be needed. And I suppose trying to gather in that information and be able to assess that information is not something that will be instantaneous. We, we have to work on every scenario. And it's also the case, I think, that for a lot of the expenditure, largely will be the case irrespective of whether there's a, you know, there's certain things that will be mitigated by a full return. But for a lot of the ongoing, you know, uh, expenses, and indeed even one expenses, will happen irrespective of whether it is a, phased return, a partial return, or full return. So, for example, uh, schools in terms of risk assessment will need, um, as part of that, will, will need sort of a level of, of probably additional level of cleaning, which will need to take place ahead of schools reopening. And even if you had a full level of confidence to say, here are particular arrangements where, for example, say in primary schools, we're going to rely much more on whole class bubbles than necessarily the, the social distancing. If that was the route, for instance, that was gone down, uh, irrespective of whether you do that route or whether you have, even if, if you'd had a situation where there was two metres social distancing, you're still pretty much left with the same issues as regards sort of cleaning costs as well. So a lot of those things will be kind of irrespective of the precise formula that will be there for um, re-engagement. I think where it probably would impact uh, would be some level of particularly ongoing costs if we're looking at, say, additional support in terms of additional premises that would be needed. Uh, I think, in first instance, on that side of it, we would also look to see if we need some additional support from that sort of things. To what extent can voluntary community organisations, the likes of church organisations, sporting organisations, step up as well to, to provide some level of additional support uh, as well? But I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that ideally on that, we want to get a wee bit of a clearer picture before um, we entirely go down that route. But it may be useful that some of that stuff is identified, even if it's not necessarily needed. Because I think to have stuff that is ready and ready to go, even if it's not needed, I think is, is something that's helpful as well, because nobody knows the exact course of events that's going to take place. Yeah, I agree with you, Minister. I, uh, it's ideal that we have all children back to school in September, and if we have to use um, buildings and facilities close to us, that um, would be very useful. So it would be good at this stage, even in preparation, that schools would be doing that work, connecting in with them, getting that direction from yourselves, finding out what the needs us, and having all of that ready. Um, I just worry that there's so much to do. I don't need to tell you, but I worry there's so much to do. I mean, oh. every time it lands back in the middle of August and there's all these questions still floating about, if we no, can no. get... Which is why, which is why, Karen. I think. It, look, I think it's important. For instance, if there is any, if we're able to do across the system, call it a level of gear change um, in terms of what what can be done, that that is made very clear before uh, you know the doors are open at any stage, or even for the preparation stuff that is there. Uh, again, what I would say in terms of guidance, we, we've tried to give, do the match of giving uh, as much information as we can, judging the fact that there are constraints that that. There will always be changing circumstances will will create that and try to give as much time and it, it's about trying to strike that that balance as much as possible in that regard but you know i, I don't demur yeah. from your general point yeah minister uh given the voluntary redundancy scheme for teachers is focusing uh concentrating on unavoidable redundancies this year um it's just my local school here um has ran into some difficulties so uh, they obviously take into account the voluntary redundancies coming up to be able to balance their books um, and now be facing going into a deficit given the, the short time frame in relation to be able to balance their book. Is there any consideration being given to the schools in those circumstances? Well, look, if, if there's individual schools want to contact us, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. I think probably the issue, particularly given the tightness of, of budget, um, you know, nobody wants to see redundancies full stop, but in terms of across the board, 
Um, I suppose the issue is that if there are particular sets of circumstances which we need to go further than what is, call it regarded as being absolute necessity, but where there's advantage, I'm sure, again, we can try and make the case, particularly as regards some of that funding with DOF, to try and uh, bid, bid for that. You know, I suppose, um, and we'd initially put in, as, as obviously the committee is aware, uh, a particular overall um, call this year ahead of COVID in terms of what was required. And I'm not, I'm not blaming anybody in relation to this, but I mean, obviously we got roughly about half of what, 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 what we asked for. But to be fair, there are other departments from a similar position. There's only so much can go around. And to some extent, I think some of the potential redundancy costs um, ultimately just had to be considered as not as high priority as trying to deal particularly with um, the issues around pay, the issues around um, trying to create a level of, of support for school budgets, uh, and also the issues around the SEN. So to some extent, therefore, that, that doesn't maybe narrow the scope, the, the yeah. potentially for redundancies. Yeah. But it, it means that I think if we're looking to do stuff beyond what has been 100% absolutely necessary on that, on that basis on it, then you know we will need to seek some level of additional uh, support but I mean, yeah. the, the, you know, there's, there's an argument that can be a certain level of invest to save with some of that, that side of it as well. I'll come back to Cheryl on that one um, separately. Uh, just uh, sort of finally, Minister, we heard this morning from the National Children's Bureau um, uh, around children and young people's emotional well-being. And one area identified as causing anxiety is bullying. Um, the Bullying Act full implementation has been paused, as we knew, know last year, and we know the reasons why. Just asking, um, will, can you confirm, will this be fully implemented in September? I don't think we've been in a position to go straight ahead in September. Look, we'll, we'll get back to you to confirm. Obviously, there's been a level of delay. Look, I want to say this move as, as quickly as possible. But I also don't want to give maybe a um, necessary a false, false assurance, which maybe can't then be met in September. There's an awful lot of stuff, particularly as regards um, a whole range of things in, in terms of the restart of schools. And I, I don't want this to just simply get crowded out with, with other things in relation, but we will move ahead on the anti-bullying side as soon as we possibly can. Yeah, no problem. And just finally, um, last point, more than anything, the youth sector minister is still waiting for direction and guidance. I know the Education Authority has worked up a number of documents, but I'm still being told today that they haven't received, um, you know, it's not clear. I'm being bombarded with groups, particularly from the community and voluntary sector. So I know that that stuff, I think, is sitting ready to go if we could get that out just... Well, I mean, I, I can just say it's not sitting, it's not sitting on my desk no, in that regard. So, um, we'll but follow we'll follow that up with the oh, EA, because obviously they would be the, the people yeah. who would be yeah. issuing that. Great. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Robin Newton, MLA. Uh, thank you, Minister. And thank you, Derek and John. Uh, Minister, your diligence in attending the, the committee. Uh, I would like to return to uh, the matter that the Chair raised around the uh, SEN pupils, uh, if you don't mind. And mm -hmm. indeed, uh, Chair, well, you, you would know, Minister, the position that uh, the committee took around the statementing problems uh, and indeed calling for the Education Authority to, to produce their report, which at this stage certainly seems to be a very welcome report. And indeed, the ongoing concerns that have been expressed over many years now on the uh, um, area planning issue. Minister, can mm -hmm. I ask, in terms of the, the, the problem that arose this year, in terms of the, the huge number of SEN pupils that uh, were identified as not having a place, and, and congratulations to you and your team on reducing it now to the 106, and hopefully that can indeed be, be further reduced. But indeed, in terms of area planning and the statementing work, unless we get those issues right, are we not going to return to a similar problem next year? Well, I think there's a reasonably valid point, Robin, in, in relation to that on it. That's why I think the report was done. Uh, I think, to some extent, what we're seeing is an outworking of the legacy issues uh, from that point of view of, of EA. But again, I think there should have been greater preparation done. Look, we have, I mean, I suppose to give indications as well, um, I think EA has secured additional finance in terms of the, uh, to provide, I think, sort of uh, 
an additional sort of 25 classrooms across 14 schools for September 2020, which should feed in, I think, in terms of uh, the numbers to be able to, to deal with that. You know, it's about, I suppose, providing solutions which can actually meet the needs, particularly of, of this September, but then could have sort of longer term impacts. And I know, I think, the EA, in terms of area planning, I think has recently, I think in the last week in June, has considered a wider uh, area plan issue as regards, at least in terms of the principles of that, of uh, special ed. But, you know, as we've indicated previously, we, we do take this, this very seriously. But I suppose some of this has arisen through systemic problems. So it's not going to be something that, that we can put in short term measures which can ease things for September. But there's actually it's going to be part of a wider long term fix. Yeah, it's good news, sir, that it is being looked at in the, the longer term and a longer term fix and a strategy put in place to, to address that. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm content on that. Thanks, uh, thanks Robin. Um, indeed, Minister, my understanding is that uh, Belfast area planning on special schools suggests that it, as much as a, an additional special school is potentially needed um, to cope with demand, is that something that has been raised with well, you at this stage? The issue, I mean, no, it's not been, not it's been directly issued. And I think particularly if we're looking at, at where we are on that side of things, it, it is probably about providing additional classrooms in the, in the short term, because clearly if there was a, and I know a number of schools have got, for instance, in terms, in terms of rebuild, you know, it, it does strike me that I think one of the areas that, um, that I think changes need to be made, it's it, maybe not just an issue for special schools, but beyond that, uh, will be that whenever, for instance, we're looking at rebuild, we try and, to a certain extent, future-proof those so that it's not a question of what is the is the enrolment, if you like, that they initially had got, but what actually is to look to what would be the uh, sort of a wider, longer-term context in that in that regard. I mean, I think it's also an issue, I think, that, that, again, it maybe shows the fact for many years that there wasn't that strategic area planning, but, you know, if you were starting from a blank page as regards provision of special schools in Belfast, you wouldn't necessarily end up with the configuration that, that you have. But again, it's about going from where, where we are in that regard. Just obviously, if there was a case made that there was an additional special school that was needed, um, then that would take a considerable time to do. So it, it may well be about actually looking within the existing estate and what can actually, at least for the short to medium term, could be provided on, on that side of it. Okay. Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Um, thank you, uh, Chair, uh, and uh, thank you, Minister, and uh, uh, Derek, and, and uh, the, the Deputy John. Permanent Secretary as well, John, yeah. Uh, Minister, he's, when he's, you open up... I think he's, I think he's feeling very neglected here in that, in that regard, but... He's, he's very quiet. He, he, he's, he's lucky because we would only pick on him today. <laughs> Uh, look, uh, you know, I'm tempted to say John and me are here because it's raining at, at the in the cricket type of thing. So uh... <laughs> I was thinking about your opening remarks in relation to the three musketeers. I had a, <laughs> I think, a, quite a few principles after yesterday's statement. Minister would come up with a few other, <laughs> a few other <laughs> things. But, but I'll not condone that. We'll work through it. No, we'll work through we will it. Do. We will do. We will do. Yeah. Uh, Minister, uh, I appreciate that you've provided us with some clarification as to the letter that has been provided to principals and has caused some alarm uh, in relation to uh, the reopening of schools. And, and you'll know that I have continually raised this with you as early as, or as recent as last uh, week in the Assembly as well. I'm conscious, Minister, that the finances uh, uh, in Northern Ireland are limited, but I'm also very aware that for the... Uh, Schools across England, the Prime Minister has announced £1 billion for, COVID, for a COVID catch-up plan. Uh, yeah. And I understand as well that uh, we should receive a Barnet consequential in relation to that. But have you got any figures? Or has it no, been confirmed I, that we have Barnet consequential of that no, or not? Um, no, I, there has, I, look, I understand, which I think will probably be about now, and I don't know whether this will then purely relate to the broader economic package, but I understand, I think there's call it sort of a certain level of mini budget the Chancellor is doing at present. Um, mm -hmm. And I understand probably arising out of that, there then tends to be an indication from Treasury to the Department of Finance of what general Barnet consequentials are, are there. Uh, I, I would suppose make two points, I suppose, in, in general. Quite often you get a situation where there is 
Um, Treasury will then give some indication to DOF, and there's a little bit of a turf war between Treasury and DOF as to what it exactly means. But what I'm also conscious of, of governments at Westminster, of whatever political hue, sometimes will make big announcements in terms of um, particular levels of finance. Um, and it may or may not be as simple as it appears, i.e., sometimes whenever a figure is announced, it then becomes clear that a certain percentage of it or all of it is effectively money raised from easements elsewhere. So it's not additional money, because obviously it's only, if you like, if there's an, on that basis that in terms of a level of Barnet consequence it would be roughly about, potentially about 30 million, roughly about 3% is what we get. Um, if, it's, if it is a full billion of pure additional money. But the issue on that basis is, is that entirely new money? Is it money which has been come from other savings? Is part of that the case? What we think is that stuff which is all within the one financial year? So, you know, you've, you've a range of things there. It will take a little bit, of, you know, we've been pursuing the, the direct link in those things tends to be not with our opposite numbers in education, but finance then has a sort of a, a level of discussion with Treasury and you can be assured, at least in terms of starting the ball rolling on that, I think, I think that was announced, more or less broke on whatever whatever debt was on, on the news at about 7 or 8 in the morning. And I think before 9 o'clock, our officials were on the DOF to get them to pursue up Treasury as regards to that. So there's a bit of uncertainty. The other issue, just probably making it in a broader sense, obviously, is uh, while I think we would have very strong moral claim to that, that money, or indeed, for instance, in terms of the additional capital, which may happen this year um, as well, uh, any money which it occurs to Barnet consequences, unless it is very specifically ring fenced. So, I think, for instance, the money the other day that was announced for sort of an arts recovery package, I think, as far as I can see, I think was ring fenced for different regions of the, the UK. Unless that's the case, then it goes generally into the departmental, uh, sorry, into the DOF coffers. Sometimes that will benefit us, and sometimes. Um, you know, we won't necessarily get that. So simply, even if there was 30 million to be made available at rising out of it, doesn't necessarily mean that education gets all of that 30 million. Well, can, 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 I'm assuming you've already done this, or, or, or Derek or John has it, but can you request some clarification around that? Because th that figure of £1 billion pound catch-up plan has been muted for quite some time, uh, and I just think it would uh, help. No, no, uh, yeah, if we, we, yeah, no, in terms of clarification, we have that. That's the point I was making that essentially, from the clarification, we have to work through DOF in terms of clarification. On the morning that the uh, Prime Minister announced that, or it was on the morning news, I think before we'd started at 9 o'clock in the morning, we had that request in for clarification to, to the Department of Finance. Uh, but I think as regards, broadly speaking, Barnet Consequentials, we'll only start getting a clearer picture of those probably after the Chancellor's statement today. And even then, from experience, I know sometimes... To get that point at which which DOF is full clarity of Treasury sometimes can take maybe a fortnight on that basis on it. But yeah, no, we have asked for that and we'll continue to press for that. And I'm, I'm a right in saying, Minister, you'd have some confidence that there will be extra money brought into the ring for um, for education, particularly to address, as the Prime Minister described, it, lost teaching time on primary those primary pupils well, to extend. That's, that's where that's where we've already had put in a bid. Uh, for this financial year for 12 million. And that's that's effectively for um, a sort of a catch-up programme, call it continuity of learning, call it engage, yeah, whatever way yeah, you want to put it. Yeah. So th that at least 12 million has already been secured. Uh, I suppose as we scope that out, as I said, there will probably be some stuff that will go beyond that into the next financial year. Um, you know, I, I suppose the issue was if, if somebody was making additional money available, may also be that there will be other calls on that, even from ourselves, uh, on that as well. But look, we'll, we'll have to see exactly where that, that lands. I, I just know from experience that if there's an announcement across the water of a billion, we don't necessarily always just see that translated into a straight read across in terms yeah. of Barnet, because it might end up be, for the sake of argument, it ends up, and I'm just making a supposition here, it might end up be that, that, say, 400 million of that is new money and 600 million is from savings from within other departments to help pay for this, mm -hmm. you know, so it's... it's uh, and obviously, if it's simply savings to pay for it, it then isn't in, a, in and of itself additional money. It doesn't have Barnacle. So, look, I'm always just slightly cynical whenever there's a big announcement, although I think there are some indications from, from the Department of Education in England that see this as being sort of additional money, certainly to themselves. Uh, and the 12 million figure, the 12 million, I think you said, was it? The 12 million figure that you said. Do you think, given this 
eyes with the school estate in Northern Ireland that's sufficient to deal with the the, the demands that are clearly going to come from the, from every school uh, in relation to the necessary preparations for the reopening of the school school estate. Uh, we're talking, Daniel, two separate things. That money is specifically uh, has been ring fenced and was secured from Department of Finance as part of a bid for continuity of learning. So this will be to provide, you know, whether it's on literacy and numeracy or a range of other things across the board, provide additional support, you know, whether that's by way of um, some additional uh, classroom teachers, staffing, short-term intervention. I mean, things of this nature have been done before, so a number of years ago. I'm not saying the model will be necessarily the same, but the signature project that was used in terms of particularly targeted, socially deprived areas um, on, on that basis. So we're scoping out the details of that, that proposal, but it's not... I wouldn't, disag I wouldn't sort of um, lump it in just as part of the overall money that will be required, for example, if, if we need to have additional cleaning material or hygiene. That, that's not the purpose of this. This is actually focused in very much at uh, teaching, additional teaching materials and um, staffing issues with regards to pupils rather than, um, you know, providing some of the, the, the practical mechanisms that will be required directly for schools to, to operate on a, on a full basis. That, that money would have to be kind of a separate, a separate pot. Daniel? I think we've right. them. Okay. Uh, Starly for making my job easier for me. Um, okay. Um, bring, um, I, 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 don't, I don't know if, there, if some of that can be diverted towards broadband, West Room, in that regard, Chair. But, uh, I'll, bring, I'll bring Robbie Butler in and I'll bring Daniel back in for supplementary if we have time. Robbie? Yeah. Am I in the spotlight? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, Minister, um, I, I say thank you to that many times. People probably think I'm in the DUP. Um, but I, I, I genuinely... Uh, I, but I'm not going to... Did you think... Sorry, go ahead. Form, the form's in the post. You may have to... Um, <laughs> you may have to use gloves when, when filling it out. Uh, but... Yeah. No, um, genuinely, um, I've said this before. Said, well, this is the last thing I'm going to say. Thanks. I actually think you've, you've done a, a pretty good job as a minister. I'm buttering you up for an ask here, by the way. And you've got the two guys. You've the two guys beside you. They're going to say yes to you when I ask you. This is my third question. But we'll go to the first one, okay? And it's probably an extension of what you were going to say to Daniel because. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely interested in the Engage programme. Now, I understand that it may not be complete yet, but I want to give you an opportunity, even if you can flesh out a little bit of what Engage um, needs to do. And I read a little bit about what you'd written about it, and you know, you're going to be um, certainly looking at the the, uh, the disparity in education in, in, in terms of the uh, social deprivation and, and, and that type of stuff. So do you, do you want to take even five minutes maybe to, to flesh that out a bit, as far as it has got at the moment? Sorry. No, I will say differently. Look, what I think, um, look, I think there's probably a limited amount of detail directly. We're working particularly with the likes of CCEA and ETI to produce up a, a programme. I think we would look that it would be something that, that could hit the ground. It may, I, I think it, it probably, because I think it, it wouldn't be right directly if it was there from the 1st of September, because I think one of the, the very early jobs that I think yeah. also schools will need to do We'll do a certain level of assessment of, um, and I'm not talking about any particular sort of formalised test or anything of that nature, but I think schools will, will need to get a, a certain level of handle as to what, what the level of lost learning is, uh, particularly amongst their, their pupils. And that, I think, will help, if you like, um, provide a bit of focus as to precisely what level of recovery is, is there. So, you know, potentially we're looking at something that would uh, kick in during the autumn term, probably, I would guess, about October. Uh, in terms of the detail of that, I think there's still a good deal of work work to be done. Uh, apart from just, as I said, the particular smaller summer interventions, uh, that will leave, we reckon, a little bit over 11.2, 11.3 million that can be made available to the programme for this financial year. It will probably, as I said, go a little bit, there will be probably a bit more money needed for the remainder of the following year. In terms of the detail of that, it's probably still a bit of an early stage, Robbie, to be able to, to um, scope out the details. But obviously, with, with that sort of money, we could have something that's relatively you know, has, has a reasonable level of reach within that, it will mean that uh, while it, there will be a focus in particularly where there is uh, a level of disadvantage on that regard, we hope with, with 11 plus million that, that that can be something which can have a, a reasonable level of, of reach. But 
you know, I don't think things are absolutely set in concrete in terms of the precise nature of things at this stage. So I don't want to give people, again, sort of um, false sort of assumptions as to precisely what was going to happen. But, you know, <coughs> we're very excited about this. Yeah. Well, no. Yes. Uh, sorry, I think, I think I I was... add one point. I mean, there is a team working up propose, proposals for Engage. And as the minister earlier said, we did a few years ago have a starter for 10. I'm not saying it will be the model, but it focused on literacy and numeracy. The minister hasn't seen those proposals. But as the minister hinted at, the other important thing in all of this will be co-design with school leaders themselves, which we have found immensely useful in producing the guidance that has gone out hitherto. We want to do something that they find useful that will reflect their needs. And as the minister says, we do not want to present a fait accompli from the start of term, because the first task for school leaders will be to assess the impact of the loss of learning so that this program reflects what they need. So there's a fair amount of engagement to be done. But as I say, the minister will shortly get a set of outline proposals. And if the minister is content with that, we will engage with school leaders on those. Um, thank you for that, guys. And I'll just put this on the record. I, I agree with that approach, by the way. And the reason that I do is that I have a real concern around blended learning and the distance learning and the inequity of it. And there's certain things that within the Department of Education's remit you cannot touch. And that goes into the, that broadband piece where even Daniel today has dropped out. And, and, and we're not far enough into that, that, that technological fix. I think it's a good fix in the long term. But I think by taking the time to get it right the first time around, because the need to gather that, that curriculum gap is going to be quite a piece of work. I just encourage it. Uh, certainly a lot of the feedback I'm getting with regard to what has been a blended learning approach to this point is it, a lot of parents are struggling with it. A lot of pupils are struggling with it. And um, we need to do, you know, as I think it was the, 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 the deputy chair said, and agreed with you, Minister, we need to, it would be ideal if we can get all our children back in the school that is the most equitable place to, for, for learning. And um, therein lies the, the flexibility that's needed with Engage and all of these, these processes. Um, so I'm just, this is, I'm just going to go straight to the last one. It's a simple one. And, and I know you're going to say, yes, you look at it for me. Um, this one comes up every year, and I think the policy does need to be looked at. So EA do administer this, but it does come from a policy directive, and it's school travelling and transport. And it's with regard to um, children who, um, in terms of when the, when the selector school... Is that, um, you? Is, that, is that you ringing or us? Um, I'm going to... I can, I can hear a phone going in the background, but I'm just making sure it's one of us. No, no, that's me. I've just hung it up. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's... it's it's, 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 I, I suspect it's probably Steve Aitken saying, what's this about you defending to the DUP? But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> you probably said you didn't. <laughs> you probably give you money to take me. Um, this is in regard to the, 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 the... It's an EA policy, but to take the directive from the department with regard to how you apply for school transport. Um, the, the, you know, a, a pass, for instance. So you have, to, you have to have applied for the schools in your area, but if you sit the transfer test, and for instance, if you go around your schools... And one of the schools says, you, first of all, you need to apply here first. You also know from your score that you're not going to get into the other two schools. If you don't select those two schools, you don't get the transport because you, you failed the policy because you should have obviously picked the two schools which are closest to you. I think there's a, a, there's a much better way of doing that policy or a policy review is required because there's a lot of evidence there now over the years for sitting the transfer test where people intuitively know between the parents and the teachers before that application um, has went through, that actually you, you're going to go to a school that you know you're going to go to. You've also been um, instructed by the, the um, uh, principal of that school that we would like you to put in for this is your first choice. So some parents, and it's not big numbers, are just, they're hamstrung and they're having to pay the transport for their kids, um, even though they, everybody knows what's going to happen. So could, could we just even have a look at the policy? Look, I think, I suppose just pick up a couple of points in, in um, the last few bit. I mean, look, first of all, I think as regards to blended learning, just touch on, on that. Yeah. Uh, look, I think the, the reason, you're right in terms of, I think, the reason why we want to see five day a week uh, return is that it's both the most beneficial but also most equitable on that, on that basis. And uh, I think no matter what good work is done, there's been a lot of really good work done on remote learning in terms of guidance, in terms of assistance, it is by its nature. It, it, it will, will always be in second place to that direct, that direct learning. And I think probably in terms of equity, 
it's not even necessarily between areas. You can get, because of individual family circumstances, you can get two houses standing right beside each other, um, two families going with the, the children in the same year, going to exactly the same school, maybe in different situations as regards the, their ability to be able to absorb that, that blended learning, the help that they can, they can get. So I think that, that that is critical as well. Look, as regards transfer, we'll always, transport will always keep that um, in mind. We obviously want to make sure that whatever there is equitable. Uh, my, my guess on it is, Robbie, and I know at first instance, obviously the transport side largely lies within EA, but uh, given probably the levels of costs that are there within transport, it, you know, there, there is likely to be in forthcoming times some levels of reform in, in transport. I suspect the more likely, if you forgive the, the, the pun, direction of travel, will be on actually seeing that, that there's a high level of cost towards transport and can perhaps some of that money... Can different systems be put in place so that money, some of that money goes directly into the front line of classrooms? Will that mean, therefore, that it is more likely that we'll see some level of reduction in entitlement rather than uh, an increase in entitlement? You know, I'm purely speculating here, but maybe yeah, the Prime Minister... Just wants to... very, very quickly, Robbie, you're absolutely right. Policy rests with us on home to school transport. And as you may recall, prior to COVID, we had a transformation program with a number of projects and one of the biggest projects was looking at home to school transport, looking at all of the issues, all of the oddities in there, and there are some, all of the anomalies with a view to bringing forward a comprehensive package of proposals to the Minister. That all stalled with COVID, but it will be resurrected along with the other transformation projects as per the Minister's wishes. So we will be looking at all of those things from a policy perspective. Well, I really appreciate that. I appreciate both points. And just so in case I haven't worded it right, I will email the minister just, just to, to maybe put it down paper slightly, slightly better. Uh, well, look, if you, if you, look, if you, if you want to eat Robbie email, like, I appreciate yeah. some of the stuff. Sometimes it's getting to yeah. the nuance of the thing. Sometimes it's not yes. easy either. Thank you. If you want to send that, we'll, we'll take a look at it. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. All right, thanks. You can always just end selection and attend your local school, alternatively, as well. Um, okay, Morris Bradley. Yeah, no, okay. Sir, if, only I, if only I had thought of that. <laughs> Morris Bradley, thanks. Thank you very much, Chair. You got that on very well, I must admit. Okay. Uh, just to follow on from, from Robbie's theme on transport, uh, it's still an issue given the current social distancing rules. Yeah. Uh, it will cause a problem for children trying to get to school, and I think I asked this last week, has any gu guidance been given to the uh, bus providers, the, the private bus providers as well, and not only that there, the taxi drivers on what the social distancing rules are and what the provision is for back-to-school transport? Well, Morris, the, the issue uh, we haven't, there's, there is sort of guidance that is potentially ready. Guidance hasn't been issued for a very good, very good reason. There has been a bit of a movable position on transport that has been there with the executive. And so, for instance, the issue, although it doesn't directly, there's an exemption for school transport, the issue of masks um, was put in place. And it may well be that masks ultimately end up as some level of mitigation measure. Because I think, look, I think you make a very valid point, And I think, um, I understand, I think the, the infrastructure minister is in front of her committee uh, this morning as well. Now, look, I, I think across the board, if we end up at a situation... Uh, where strict social distancing remains um, a key prerequisite for transport, I think, I think there are very major problems because even at one metre, the indications are that would mean for buses 25% full and that, that would be something that goes beyond simply what happens in terms of school transport but, but beyond that. So, look, I, I think we need to reach a situation, particularly as regards children, in which we can um, come a lot closer to what would be normal. Now, I think that what is likely to happen, which will take some level of pressure off this, and it's something I wouldn't discourage, uh, would be that I think there will be some elements of behavioural change that will take place in terms of transport. What I mean by that is, in some cases, where, where I could encourage it, I think it, it is useful to have um, active travel in terms of either walking or cycling. That probably will not make a really major impact. But I think there will also be an impact that where parents are in a position to take children directly themselves, in a lot of cases, they will want to do that. So I think that will ease a little bit of the pressure. But unless we get an overall position or agreement or simply have to go ahead on the basis of 
other mitigation measures other than strict social distancing, I think we will be left with a major with a major headache and a major difficulty. So, at the moment, if, if guidance was being issued, it would have to be on the basis of perhaps a one metre social distance, because that's what's happening uh, on that side of things. Again, I think it's critical that there's an examination and that things move on before we reach the, the new school year. But I don't really want to be issuing something in July, which then potentially gets contradicted three or four weeks later, type of thing on that basis, if it's if it's at all possible. Okay. And I think I think I think also in clarification would be that in terms of that whatever is there in terms of school transport and buses, we'd also have to have a, a feed through in terms of what is there in terms of uh, in terms of taxis. And I think where there's a particular need um, to ensure that we find solutions which find other forms of mitigation. If we are stuck with particular levels of social distancing, uh, that will impact on everybody to to a very great extent. I think the concern particularly would be that that would particularly detrimentally impact on a range of special needs pupils who, uh, because of maybe physical requirements, would be even more um, detrimentally impacted by social distancing. So it's, it, there is ongoing work in relation to... I want to get one position and get it absolutely clear to people. OK, thanks for that, Minister. And, and as you say, it is, it is changing every day. Uh, the other one point through you, Chair, uh, you've got your plan for... Uh, back to school, is it? Do you are you experiencing any resistance from head teachers or boards of governors to your plan of getting all the children children back to school uh, roughly August September? No, do you, re do you take any resistance? No, look, I mean, look, people have made I think the very valid points that in terms of uh, because we put in place sort of uh, sort of you know minimum position on the, on that that I think. Um, I think with the exception of one I can think of where there's there maybe an issue, that pretty much any of the schools we've heard has at least gone in terms of the minimal position. We haven't had any particular negative kickback on that side of things. What is the case? Now? Look, I, I think this is something which unifies people. So I know sometimes people will, will tend to create a situation of, is there a different position between teachers and parents or whatever? It, it's undoubtedly the case that teachers, principals, parents... Um, the public in general and myself, I think, are probably all on the same page, which essentially says if we can reach a point at which um, in the relatively near future we can give a green light to particular arrangements which enable everybody to be in five days a week, I think that's something which, which absolutely everybody... Well, uh, having sometimes experienced social media, I think whatever you do, it's, it's difficult to maybe get absolute uniformity, but that 99.9% .9 of people would, would embrace and be happy with. OK, Master, thanks very much for that, and thanks for your attendance today, and thank you, Derek and John. Thanks, Morris. Catherine Kelly? Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you all for briefing us again today. Um, Minister, this week I have been contacted by a childcare provider who applied for the support scheme almost five weeks ago. They found out this week that they're to receive around £240 per month for April, May and June. This doesn't even cover their rent. Um, this provider is, is not on their own um, and is but another example of how the scheme was a fail and that it cannot be repeated. When will we see the new childcare support scheme launched and who will be administering it? Well, there's a business case... I, I... It will be a different organisation to BSO. There's, there's currently a business case, which I think is with the economists for clearance on that basis. And similarly, in terms of redesign of the scheme, we've been, so I can't really go into detail on it, but it would be there for relatively soon. But look, you're right in terms of something was put together, I suppose, relatively quickly. It was done uh, with others in relation to it. I think for some it has worked out and others it, it hasn't. So I think we do need a, a very different type of scheme um, on that, on that basis. On obviously, I can't comment on the individual cases of particular childcare providers. On that basis, we've got to make sure that we've got something that enables um, everybody possible to to open in that regard. Now, some of that is also, I think, with a range of other um, related topics. So, I think there were problems created, for example, by the initial definition in terms of key workers. The fact that that it was actually restricted to key workers. So, I think some of those lessons have been learned. But I think in terms of the design of scheme, yes, there, there's there's changes getting made to that and we hope to have something uh, very quickly and needs to be very quickly um, in relation to yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, Catherine, I would just add, uh, as the Minister says, the team has worked with the Child Care Reference Group to learn the lessons 
and there are lessons to be learned. They've worked with the Child Care Reference Group to design a scheme which will focus on supporting settings to be open and will be more accessible and simpler to administer. And we have identified a potential partner with whom to operate. Um, and as the Minister says, it would be wrong to get ahead of the business cases, but those will be approved very, very soon. So it will be a different scheme with different administrative arrangements designed in partnership with the reference group. But I don't want to give you an exact date as the Minister hasn't done. Thank he would be getting ahead uh, of the uh, business uh, case process. And I know, Catherine, we've said we've identified a partner. So if we could have a con I'm tempted to say if, if you're willing to volunteer to be the person running the scheme on it, we could have a wee conversation offline in relation to it. <laughs> No worries. Um, just just on that, um, and thanks thanks for that update. I think that this proves how important it is for there to be consultation with stakeholders, um, and that was something that was missing from the first scheme. Um, and I have every faith in the in the reference group um, that that the, the next scheme will be. Um, yeah. No, look, I think Catherine. I, th I think the reference group has been a critical development. I suppose to be fair, and it was again cross departmental side of it. I suppose where particularly we were hit the first time, but won't be the second time. In terms of that, uh, you know, we were left with a situation that we had to put something in almost immediately on that basis once the funding was there, which meant that that um, even sort of the, the cursory level of consultation couldn't really take place, or else you you were delaying even further potentially people that were that were going to be the danger of them going under. I think the the reference group has therefore been a very useful tool and asset to ensure then that. that Hopefully, what is brought forward is something that's entirely fit for purpose. Thanks for that, and Chair. Just just one more question, um, Minister. You mentioned that twenty one of the special schools will be providing summer provision um, for children and young people, um, and this is great news. Um, can you give us some more detail on what the summer provision will actually look like? Well, it, it's a mixture of I think some there will be a little bit of online stuff, but with also with uh, the schools themselves providing um, a level of facilities. I think we, we kind of threw split days uh, on that basis. The, the point I'm making particularly as regards to 21 is, and um, we're glad to see this has now been achieved. Traditionally, I think there had been in normal summers, 21 of the special schools did a summer scheme. And I suppose there was maybe a concern, if, you, if you'd asked us last week, said, well, would we be able to get all 21? I think we'd have, we'd have said, no, we'd, it's unlikely we're going to get all of them. All of them, I think, have signed up to it. Maybe the permit secretary. Yeah. Catherine, it will differ from school to school. I mean, you know, special schools are not generic. Yeah. And certainly the pupils who attend do not have generic needs. So it will be down to the individual schools to determine the needs of, the, of their pupils and the care plans for those pupils. So it's very different. It's not like um, the summer schools, which we are supporting for those schools that on a voluntary basis want to open up. We have developed an outline program and curriculum for those, literacy, numeracy, play, well-being, sport, and schools can take those. We haven't done that for the special schools. It's left at a local level, so I think a generic answer would be very, very difficult to provide. Um, as the Minister says, it tends to be a mixture of in-school activity in the morning mm -hmm. and online activity in the afternoon for the 17 of the 21 who are providing both in school and online. Four are providing online activities only. If there is any more detail I can provide you with that, we will certainly write and to Catherine the committee. Would, yeah, I mean, look, we'd be happy also to write to the committee if you want to have a list of the, the schools that this will, you know, 21 schools, we'll provide that to the committee as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, bring Daniel in for a brief supplementary. Daniel? Yeah, Go sorry. Ahead. Uh, Go ahead. It's okay. I, I don't know if it's the poor Wi-Fi in Tyrone or whether the minister or someone planted operating Starleaf system to cut me off and I'm speaking too much. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'm just, just, uh, just Daniel, just because it's a conspiracy theory doesn't mean it isn't true. <laughs> Daniel, we're going to yeah, issue. I've got, got, got that. Um, vouchers. Daniel, we're issuing vouchers for Wi-Fi. We can put your name on the list. <laughs> we'll take them all up down here in Strabane and Oma. Well, maybe you will. Uh, um, I, I think I think where them will come from. M M Minister, just uh, I know it cut off earlier. This has happened to me for a few weeks now. But 
Um, you'll know that, I, that we have been greatly concerned about the poor performance of area planning, particularly in relation to special uh, needs. North Belfast uh, uh, <clears throat> is a sore and current case uh, in point. I'm delighted to hear that EA has obtained 25 additional classrooms, but I do have some uh, concerns in relation to that. Will the classrooms be in place for September uh, in order to provide the physical provision that is necessary? And also, will that ensure that the necessary be it planning permissions and other things will all uh, be sorted by that stage as well to ensure uh, that uh, the, the, the children have access to these classrooms? No, look, they, they should all be in place for September 2020. Now, you know, I have an opposite assurance they'll be there on the 1st of September, you know, yeah, those, but that would be the, the aim of it. I think in terms of planning permission, I don't think there should be any particular issue uh, with that because essentially it's, you know, these will not be suddenly, if you like, a quasi school bring, coming up on a greenfield site that's actually largely speaking, is utilising existing school facilities. So I don't think particularly planning permission would be, would be needed type of thing. Uh, and what about the specialist staff that will be required, Minister? Will they be in place by September? We're going to fund the staffing as well. Yeah, and we'll support in terms of the funding for the, the staff side of it. Uh, and obviously, particularly uh, when you're talking about special needs, it's bad nature, it's, it's uh, both creates certain legal requirements, but also actually has is bad nature quite demand, uh, demand led. So uh, that will be provided as well. That's yeah, and there is. Uh, and, we, do, we, we have a bit of we have a wee bit of flexibility in the system because although we didn't get, um, we sought, um, I suppose in terms of from the budgetary side of it, overall a considerable amount more for special needs. There is an element of that which is not absolutely in terms of delineated. So there's a bit of flexibility amongst I think about twenty million. Uh, some of it will be meeting if you like additional needs. Some will be if we reach the point where. We can get the framework starting to be to be moving into place this year, but also there's a bit of flexibility so that if, if there's an immediate need, that that can be drawn down on that side of it as well. That's why particularly we, we bid for additional money in terms of special needs. Yeah, and that, that's appreciated. Minister. I'm, I'm just wondering, a specific question was asked to me by a principal. Will, will these teachers, when in place, be trained ASD teachers to, de, to, to, to assist and support those children with, with uh, ASD needs? Look, I think there's been a considerable number of, you know, training will have to be sort of rolling forward again as part of that. Uh, I'd indicated whenever the, the overall budget was there in terms of special needs, because it is not entirely hypothecated, um, assuming that training is doable in the near future, because, you know, I don't know what level of restrictions will be there. The, the idea is to roll in, in light of the assembly motion, particularly on autism, uh, is to actually rule out sort of further levels of training to make sure that the teachers are directly uh, employed. But if you know if there's something that needs to be fast tracked for a small group of individuals, we'll try and do it. I think the only constraints as regards to any degree of training is probably some of the you know it, it's a slightly more restrictive sphere just in the immediate um, situation in, in that regard. But yeah, I mean I would think given probably the it is probably about getting teachers that can fit in with the particular needs of whatever the additional classes are. Daniel, just to come in very briefly, your colleague Justin McNulty is the only MLA that hasn't had a chance to ask a question, so you might want to um, give him a short moment to do so and by concluding your question in there. He, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm satisfied to give it over to Justin, for he hasn't, he hasn't spoken yet. So no, that's OK. Thank you, Daniel. Justin? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, John. Thanks, Minister. Um, I'm just observing the Education Restart Programme priorities scope in terms of reference and whilst there are very positive priorities there and very important priorities, I'm concerned that there's no reference at all to physical activity um, for school children, especially in the context that the English Education Secretary has recently announced a 320 million PE package for English schools and will there be a minor consequential for over here, and where is physical activity linked into what the restart program will be achieving for kids, and how important it is? And I note, oh, and I note that um, you've referenced well-being. Um, well, the well-being project team will support principals, senior teachers, and youth service leaders to develop and implement an emotional health and well-being framework, framework suited to their education setting with, with the following objectives. Now, is surely physical health is part of well-being, and surely they're yeah. all intrinsically linked, and why is physical health not being referenced whatsoever? Well, 
it, it, it is part of it is part of well being in that regard. So maybe there's not the very specific reference, but it is contained to be part of the the overall package in that regard. I, I would also say, I mean, I suppose I make the point in terms of um, any announcement from England. Again, at this stage, if there's issues around barn consequentials, um, that will ultimately then be found out. Uh, again, if there is. There's a bit of a tendency, again, across the water sometimes for big announcements with regards to funding, and it then turns out that either it's money that was already in the pipeline or it has come from sort of a recycled source from within the department. You know, it's not always just as straightforward as that. So, But we'll look to see. And, and again, I'd make also the general point with regards to Barnett is that Barnett will, will provide, where it does happen, will provide a certain amount of money to the Northern Ireland executive but generally speaking, that's not hypothecated. So it means that, that you know, if there was a particular, um, if health makes an argument that, that they need a particular amount of money for something, you know, this this something we'd be beneficiaries of this as well. Doesn't necessarily mean that, that we get it. But just in terms of the restart program, I don't know, if yeah. Derek, you wanted to. Justin, just I mean to reassure you that when we talk about well-being, we mean it in its broadest sense, and that includes physical well-being as well. And just as an example. The outline program that I mentioned earlier, that was developed for those schools that on a voluntary basis, voluntary basis want to provide summer provision, we have built in physical activity into that program as well. We recognize the importance of physical activity as contributing to recovery in its widest sense. So, you know, we haven't pulled out any specific aspect of the curriculum in the generic restart program you know we're not going to pull out languages or english or maths or history or pe but we understand that it's an intrinsic part of well-being uh, and just know i can just say uh, the way of the way of and say this has been something that's ingrained in me since i was um well since you were probably going bucked off as, as you put it i think at your at your first day at school in my um, in my post-primary part of the school song has a line san amends incorporate sano which translates from the Latin, a healthy mind and a healthy body. And I think that is very much the approach uh, that the department will take to this uh, as well. They, they are symbiotic, indeed, part of the... the, the... OK. That's good, good to hear, Minister. Um, would you give us some if steer on that, whether it's a borrowed consequential on that uh, announcement yeah, from the... As soon as, as, soon as, as soon as we learn, but I mean, yeah, we will certainly get that, that information to the committee. But again, I would just reiterate the broader point in terms of Barnet Consequentials, even if we do get clarification of Barnet Consequential, that doesn't necessarily mean that that comes to the Department of Education. It will go to the overall Northern Ireland Executive, but we will, as regards, I mean, look, I think there, will be, there are a number of issues which have been raised in terms of Barnet Consequentials. I think one of the other bits, which maybe hasn't particularly been touched on, but maybe, maybe less directly pressing, is that obviously, again, across the world, there's been announcements made in terms of some capital issues. Um, and again, once we get clarity on all those issues, we will certainly contact the, the committee in terms of, um, you know, a piece of correspondence which, which gives indications. But again, put with the health warning of it's simply that there's a barnet consequence, it doesn't necessarily mean that's education money. OK. And in terms of childcare, this notice on your dashboard, um, you've said that there has been 275 applications from closed settings and... Uh, 65 of those are still pen, pen, pending verification. What's what's the story there? Well, I think I think it's on the basis that that uh, it, both in terms of the speed of process, but also I think on the basis I think I'm right in saying that in terms of any of the settings that that they were to provide I think sort of evidential quality of information yeah. uh, to be able to get processed. So it, it's it's on the basis of kind of matching. Uh, call it historic costs, which would then be around sort of receipts, invoices, that that type of thing on it. So I presume that's still the processing which is uh, which is taking place. It's obviously it's, it's an operational matter for business service organisation, or at least yeah. historically has been. But I, th I think that's where where it is, Justin. So yeah, there are two eight hundred and seventy eight childcare settings or or child minors who are still waiting for verification. Surely that's very concerning, given that we're three months into the pandemic. And these people will have often have not been receiving any income during that time. Is that not a red flag? It depends. Actually, that's probably not the case, Justin, that they won't have been receiving any income. That's actually the problem, particularly for the closed settings. The purpose of the scheme, as originally set up, 
was to cover costs to maintain financial viability where those costs were not being met elsewhere. But many of the settings have had access to furloughing arrangements for their staff and have been able to benefit from the small business grant from the Department for the Economy. So this particular scheme is only the top-up element to maintain financial viability. And that made it complicated to administer. And that is one of the reasons why the amounts paid out were much smaller than we had originally anticipated, because all of these other sources of income were available. But you're right, BSO is still working through those We'll get the documentation in. A few more have been cleared even since the committee has received the report. And the money will be paid retrospectively uh, back uh, to the uh, And I think, I think, I think the other thing is um, that as BSO will not be involved in the new scheme, it will be a different provider. It means, I suppose, if there's maybe one crumb of comfort to be taken in terms of the BSO situation at the present, it is that, that any of their ongoing work in terms of focus will actually be on, on clearing yeah. any level of backlog. So that, you know, they're not, they're not going to be, for a better word, distracted by doing another scheme on that yeah, basis. That's true. Okay, thank you. That's, that's reassuring. Just finally, guidance, uh, school leaders are seeking guidance, urgent guidance in terms of planning for um, restart, in ter re in ter including details on uh, pupils and staff who are shielding, um, catering, Clearing details, uh, transport. Transport is crucially important for rural schools. I know you right mentioned it already, Peter. I know, but that's crucially important for rural schools in particular. Uh, additional funding in terms of whatever the, the guidelines may be that schools may need to use all spaces. Will that require a uh, substitute teacher? Will that funding be available for substitute teachers? So, just schools are. It, yeah, guys. I mean, Justin. I suppose in terms of the issues around children around shielding, that that's already out there. That, that's already out there in relation to it. We're looking at bespoke stuff, I mean, there's probably a little bit of advice in terms of the meal situation, but we're looking at sort of supplementary advice in relation to it. Transport, you're right. I want to make sure this has got right. And I think, look, I think realistically, the only solution is one which, largely speaking, enables as much as possible transport to, to go ahead fully, or else, um, I mentioned earlier, I suppose, the impact particularly on special needs children. I think it will, I think it is likely that in circumstances in which there is high levels of restrictions on transport, then I think the other sector of society that will be most strongly hit may well be rural schools in that regard, which is why I think we need to arrive at a situation there. So I want to give that advice, but I want to give it on the basis of it being um, complete. And then the other... What was the other? Um, sorry, what was, the what was the fourth point? Sorry, you mentioned about males, the... Funding, funding for sub teachers, if there has to be a, you know, further space required to, to accommodate classrooms, is it obviously a substitute teacher to cover that? Will the funding be made available? Well, it depends on depends a bit on the circumstances. So sometimes additional space, uh, it may be that if, if we have a situation in which there still has to be, call it sort of blended learning or we can't do a full school day, sometimes that will maybe be additional um, additional teaching facilities. It may also be supervised learning where you're looking at, at some level of help or assistance from a, um, a group within the community on that basis on it. Sometimes it may be on the basis that it's additional uh, space because that would enable, for instance, a full class or a, a number of full classes to take place um, beyond what simply the school could provide. So sometimes it may be substituting for a classroom as opposed to just purely additional on that, on that basis. So look, we'll look on the basis of what is additional and what is what is necessary on that on that basis. I there is part of a message though that initially schools need to look at what they can do internally. And so, for example, uh, which I, I think would probably cover a full year group. I was at a post primary school there a couple of weeks ago where they've already set up their assembly hall. They're going to be using virtual assemblies, but I set up their assembly call, hall as a call it a super classroom with about a hundred desks within it, and will largely speaking be used to maybe teach a full year and maybe reorientate. So there's, you know, there's different ways, different ways around this and we'll work with schools in terms of where there's additional necessary costs. Okay. I, I mean, don't forget, in, ter terms of, in terms of substitutes, I mean, there's, there's also likely to be a scenario where, um, for example, some of the pressures that are there financially in terms of substitutes uh, will be there perhaps in a different form. So, for example, and I'm not saying this, this way, but I mean, there'll be probably a more limited amount where substitutes, for instance, were brought in um, to relieve teachers who were 
um, out of town on courses, for instance. Now, I'm not saying courses will end, but you'll probably be delivering them in a different way. And the amount of that that'll be able to be done will be, will be sure. That's probably, I think, roughly about 10 million in the budget. Okay. So, you know, yeah, there will be a bit of headroom. Sorry for cutting across there. Pre uh, appreciate uh, your tight on time, and um, we have a, a long list of uh, final items to finish here myself. Okay. Can I just add very, very quick in closing, Minister? Um, your your guidance at the moment um, in relation to a child becoming unwell at school um, guides schools to if the child is awaiting for collection to move that child to a room where they can be isolated behind a closed door. Um, we've received significant concern in relation to that issue to the point where um, it's felt strongly that, that that guidance needs to be changed. Uh, there is concern that that is effectively seclusion of a pupil um, and that it shouldn't be happening. C can I ask you and the department to closely review that particular aspect of well, that look, guidance? We, 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 Chair, we will always look at guidance. We'll look at guidance particularly guided by, because a lot of these things are not the perfect solutions. But it would be guided, I suppose, by medical advice. And I suppose the issue might be under those circumstances, uh, do you have some form of seclusion for a short period of time or do you risk an increase in infection? And so there is a balance to be struck there. Look, we will keep all things under review. I take that point, Mr. It, it then says that appropriate adult supervision should be provided as required. Maybe that's the part of it that you can make clearer. Yeah. I, I just think the okay. idea of a child being left alone in a room behind a closed door is causing significant no, concern, I, and I think it, we would appreciate that being looked at. I think, I think yeah, look, we, we can clarify that point as well. Obviously, no problem. Particularly, okay. particularly for that, would probably be if an adult was involved, they would have to then be using particular levels of PPE equipment to, yeah. to make sure that the, that, that was the case. Yeah. And that, that's, really, that's really what's intended by the guidance. Yeah. So if we can provide any further clarification on that. Okay. One final, final question, Mr. Um, has um, legal action been initiated against the department in relation to modification of statutory duties relating to special educational needs? Yeah, there was, but it's gone a bit cold. I, I, yeah. I think, yeah, I think there, there has been. Look, um, there tends to be a range of things at times at any one particular point in time, a number of, of items of uh, uh, of legal intervention. I think, yes, I think there was something initiated. Having said that, it seems to, broadly speaking, we haven't heard anything about yeah. that sort of very recently, but yeah. Okay. The short answer, yeah. Chair, is yes. Okay. There was, there was certainly a pre-action protocol letter received, so um, we have engaged with legal teams to address that. Okay. Well, look, in, in closing, can I, I reiterate my offer that if there are any urgent items relating to the likes of modification of duties or changes of guidance that need to happen during July and August, that we are more than willing to make ourselves a, an available assembly um, format for you to provide update via. And um, thank you very much indeed for, for your time today, as, as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. OK, members, um, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring all members back into the spotlight function uh, and ask the... Uh, or sorry, I go through a few items here before I bring you in, Clark. Yeah. Can I refer members to the update on outstanding departmental COVID-19 correspondence at page 355? and seek members' agreement that this update is correct. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. I would also refer members to correspondence from OMA Learning Community on the increased use of remote devices, and seek members' agreement to forward this correspondence to the department for a response. Agreed? Yes. Okay. Can I refer... Look after the OMA ones, please, Chair. Sorry? Look after the OMA ones, please. Thanks yeah, very that, much, that Chair. Was a, that was a strong, resounding, attentive, agreed for once from you there, Daniel. Thanks. Um, OK. Can I also refer members to the correspondence from Unite on child minding issues and seek members' agreement to forward this correspondence to the department for a response. Agreed? Agreed. Thank agreed. you. Agreed. Can I refer members to correspondence from Parent Kind and Ulster University on their survey of homeschooling? And seek members' agreement to write to Parent Kind and uh, commission that organisation to determine the view of its members on the restart programme and to come to the committee early in autumn for feedback. Agreed? Agreed. So that could be an informal commissioning then? An inf yeah, informal commissioning. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thanks, Chair. Okay, and can I ask the clerk to summarise any other actions or requests for additional information resulting from our departmental briefing? So, members, I think we're writing to the department um, seeking uh, the timeline on the anti uh, bullying in schools act. We're also encouraging them to issue guidance um, on uh, for for youth sectors. Uh, we're also then seeking clarification on these uh, border consequentials, possible border consequentials around education catch up, and in particular um, whether there will be money for um, supporting physical activity. Also, I think we're um, encouraging the department to issue guidance to buses and taxis. Um, um, the minister indicated clarification is required, but we can still ask that. And additionally, uh, we're asking for them to provide information on the special schools summer scheme, including what activities are being offered and what schools are involved. And then uh, we're also asking them to reconsider again the uh, guidance on inverted commas seclusion, which is in the uh, new day school guidance. If members are content with that. Members content with that? Agreed? Agreed? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. members, um, if you bear with me, we have a significant amount of correspondence that we need to discharge before close of play here today. Um, we'll endeavour to move forward it, uh, through it as expeditiously as possible. Um, okay, Clark, do you want, wish to speak to correspondence? Yes, Chair. So, if uh, members, okay, so we've got two, two sides to this, unfortunately. Um, if we begin with uh, the meeting pack, we're starting at page 401. There is an index of the incoming correspondence with some suggestions about how to dispose of it. So just picking out some of the key ones, um, at page 403, this is a response from the department for... Uh, oh, sorry, let me remind members that they are audible. Okay. Members, just a brief reminder that you are now audible to everyone and to everyone who is watching the broadcast. Bring the clerk back in, thank you. I think somebody's got the kettle on. No problem. <laughs> anyway, um, so page 403, this is a response from the department on an important issue that members have just talked about, which is about progress around uh, the unplaced children in transition with SEND statements. Um, you know, D has indicated, as, as members already heard, that they've met with the, uh, the Education Authority about this. So, Chair, is the committee content to write to the department seeking a, sort of an urgent update um, uh, on this important matter for the, the committee? Yes. Agreed? Yeah, agreed. Okay. Great, thanks. Great. The other ones I just wanted to pick out, uh, members, was, uh, yeah, look at uh, page 428 and 494 and 592, there's a number of um, annual reports. Now, members, these have all appeared much earlier than usual. Usually what happens is they, they materialise around the end of July. So I would then read them, send them out to you, and pick out some wee points of scrutiny. I don't normally put them in meeting packs because they're enormous. So sorry for doing that. Um, but uh, I've included them for your information for now. I'll write to you again over the summer. I've read them already, um, but I want to have a... Usually what I do is I print them all out and get a highlighter and then mark up things, and then I decide whether there's uh, anything that's uh, worth uh, coming to uh, members' attention. So if our members are content just to um, note that for now, um, and uh, as I say, I'll issue uh, a note about them uh, later in the uh, summer, if that's okay. Agreed. Content? Agreed. Great. Great, thank you. Great. Right, so then we move on to the tabled pack. Uh, I'm sorry about this, but we're at page... Hold on a minute, sorry, hold on, let me get myself in the right place. Yeah, we're at page 116 of the tabled pack, and again, sorry it's so big, but at page 118, <coughs> what you have are two items which deal with governance at the Education Authority following the internal audit report on SEND statementing. The first is from DE, and sets out some information on the new SEND steering group. Um, and now the committee may wish to consider this again as part of its scrutiny of the SEND framework, which I anticipate would happen in the next session. Second letter is from the EA board chairperson indicating why she can't uh, provide oral evidence to the committee. Uh, in respect of the latter, I mean, she's suggesting that um, uh, we go back to her again in September. And uh, what I would suggest then is that members consider this again in September. Um, the option would be to invite them again or to maybe invite them to give a closed briefing if they thought that this was going to go on for much longer. So those are options which I suggest members Chair, think about in September. Yes, Daniel McCrossan, go ahead. Yeah, I have some concern about this. Uh, this is the second request we've made to the Chair 
uh, to come to the committee. Uh, and whilst I understand the extent for reasons for not attending, uh, I think it's vitally important that she does come before us. Uh, and, uh, you know, even if it's the case that she addresses this committee in closed session, if that would make her more comfortable, but I think it's important that we do hear from her. I have a great concern that the reason for not attending uh, being the internal uh, employment issues of and processes of EA uh, b b being to the centre, uh, the, the, the particular issue in question could go on for two years uh, in some instances. So I'm not confident that there'll be a resolution in September. So if we're uh, if we go back in September, I think then she'll say no, we still can't attend. So I think we need to hear from from her or someone certainly uh, from the from the EA. I agree, and the, the reasons being cited are actually um, of concern themselves, and the letter states that certain issues concerning the EA board and our relevant committee are potentially relevant to the ongoing internal processes. Um, that, I mean, that, I think that raises further concern here, um, and we, we will indeed need to return to this. Are, are members content that we return to this um, early in, in late August or early September to um, assess if internal processes have moved on adequately for us to hear um, in open session from the chair of the Education Authority or indeed whether we need to adjust our invitation to one of closed session as either way we need to hold these issues to account. Well, I'm of the view there that the sooner that the chair is before us, the better. I'm not uh, content to wait to September. I know your suggestion was early August, yeah. uh, but I certainly think the sooner the better. I, I don't think the reasons provided are acceptable to this committee. Uh, certainly there are considerable questions that we have, uh, and uh, I think it's important that uh, that uh, the chair does address our committee. Uh, I'm uh, undecided as to whether uh, that should be in closed session or public session. Uh, I would always opt for public session because it's important that we are entirely transparent and provide the most uh, open accountability and scrutiny process as possible. But if there's reasons that we believe should be discussed in private session, then we should at least consider them. But I would like to see her uh, before the committee sooner rather than later. <laughs> I could invite the uh, chairperson to come for us. We've a scheduled meeting in August, so we could invite her to come then as a, in a closed session, if that's what you want to do. Um, again, but I, I'd say the member is, is quite correct in um, committee deals in open session. And like, once you're told things in closed session, you're kind of you're caught then, because you can't then put them in the public domain. So, okay. Um, yeah, so the, the Chair of the Education Authority uh, commits to write to us in September when hopefully the position in terms of a timeline for completion of internal processes may be clearer. Um, I, I must admit I agree with you, Daniel, that I, I do not find the reasons being cited as adequate um, cause for not attending the committee. Um, especially when EA officers have attended the committee. Um, yeah. So I, I think I think we can respond, and Clark, uh, if members are content, we will again invite the chair of the Education Authority to attend the Education Committee at a date in August. Members agree? Yeah, I agree, Chair. And just just to come in briefly again, because no time is, is tight here. But even in the response from the chair of the of, of uh, the EA board, uh, uh, they use the word hopefully. And maybe is not a promise of or any commitment of coming before us in September. It's far too uh, there's far too much ambiguity around it. Uh, and certainly, I, I, I think the more I see this, the second time I've seen this, I, I'm beginning to get more questions about why they'll not come before us to discuss some of the concerns that we have. I mean, it's my it's my understanding, Mark, <coughs> that the Education Committee may have powers to require attendance at the committee. Is that accurate? 
that is the case. Um, the members would want to think about that carefully. Yeah. Uh, bear in mind that there are ongoing HR processes, we are told, and I suspect members wouldn't want to get in the way of those. But at the same time, they would have to balance that against yeah. the important points that Mr. McCross has yeah. made. The yeah. Members and clerk, the other thing that I would say is um, I think this committee, in the multiple uh, oral briefings and open session that we've had with the Education Authority officers to date, have respected the the internal processes um, that are ongoing um, so um, we are on solid ground to say that we would be able to continue to do that with the education authority chair as well so um, perhaps perhaps Clark in, in writing to invite the education authority chair to the committee um, at a date in August we you, we, we could emphasize our respect for those internal processes to date and our ability to do so at any other open session members content yeah uh, yeah, chair again again i understand that's a very complicated situation when there's internal matters that need to be addressed and processes need to be followed Uh, i think given the sensitivity around it and the huge amount of concern around the particular aspects that we're discussing and have discussed uh, i think it's still important that they are before us as soon as possible Senior directors, including the chief executive of the education authorities, you rightly pointed out, have been before us, and we've respected the internal processes uh, that uh, have been outlined to us, not to breach or overstep or provide any detail that would compromise those processes in any way, shape, or form. I think it's important that the chairperson recognises uh, the importance of our request. This isn't just an airy fairy hello. This is an, a, an accountability and a scrutiny committee, and we need to be hearing from her. And I have concern for the second time this rejected invitation. Uh, uh, have come with a lot of ambiguity as to when actually uh, the invitation is going to be accepted. I don't believe that September will conclude it either. Okay. Members content to write to the chair then? Yep. Okay. Agreed? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Clark. Okay, then. So moving on to page 130, this is uh, correspondence from DE responding to the committee's queries for the payment of performance related pay to EA directors in 2018 19. If you remember from last week, the department doesn't appear. Um, well, I don't think they've answered the question. Um, they've talked about um, pay progression, which is not the same as um, performance-related pay. Uh, not quite the same thing. So suggestion here is that uh, maybe we write to the departments again, but um, ask them specifically about the then chief executive's performance-related pay and to the EA and respective directors. So just to explain, the, ex- the chief executive at that time was not an employee of the Education Authority. He was an employee of DE. So I think they would have done his performance-related pay, whereas the directors of the EA, that would have been done by the EA board, I would have thought. So it's just to go back, I'll, I'll, I'll take a little excerpt from the uh, annual report and accounts and send it to DE and EAs to make sure there's no misunderstanding. Okay, agreed. agreed. Yeah, yeah well, just, just again, very briefly. Yeah. This is an important uh, issue, given what has happened within various directorates of the Education Authority. And it gives great concern publicly to those in education and parents of those children who have been affected uh, by some of the failures of EA in relation to SEN children. It is very worrying that senior directors uh, responsible for such uh, have received pay performance related increases. And uh, that, by any sense, is a bonus uh, by any definition. Uh, and, and there has to be huge questions asked about who evaluated this and made the judgment that that pay increase should be added on and also uh, I would uh, if they're listening air caution on whether or not such an increase would happen this year because that would certainly send out a very dangerous message and we would be great okay then moving on then at page 133 is an EA response to committee queries relating to SEN in North Belfast um, EA confirms also that the, the definition of special educational need continues to apply to ASD children. That had been an issue which Nikki had raised. Are members content to note that? Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Then we have a page 139. Um, this is some correspondence from SIA. And SIA were, um, we had a wee chat, but I didn't expect them to write to us. Um, but we had a wee chat with them about them coming along to brief the committee on GCSE results day, and they've since said, yeah, they can. So uh, if members are just content to note that, and uh, so we are expecting to get a briefing from them on uh, both the uh, A-level uh, results and the GCSEs in August, if members are content to note. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Then, Agreed. 
That's good. Pages 137 and sorry, 140. I've gone a bit, gone a bit school with there, but there's some correspondence from SIA regarding examination uh, payments to invigilators, markers, and moderators. Now, what SIA appears to be indicating is that this is a matter for DE. Um, now, uh, do members want to uh, write to DE seeking clarity on this? I think Mr. Butler might want to come in. Robbie? Yeah. That's okay. Yes, I, I received um, uh, lobbying on this issue from the ventilators and markers and stuff. So um, I think at the, the committee meeting it had been indicated that they would, it's certainly my summation of how I picked it up, that it would be something that CCA would look at. Um, they seem to be passing the buck on this. So I would say um, clarification from CCEA as well as a letter to the department, because I'm not too, I'm not overly happy that this would just be passed to the department. I think it's a reasonable question to ask of the department, um, Chair, but I think a CCEA is answering that. And my recollection of how the information came to us don't tally up completely. So, yes, if you'd be content, I would uh, appreciate a, a letter seeking clarification. Members, yeah, uh, if I could come on the back of that, Chair, uh, I too have received considerable uh, uh, correspondence from uh, and leaders, examiners, etc., uh, concerned about this. And at the earliest stage, Justin Edwards and others have corresponded with me to say that whilst this is a complicated issue, they're working through the processes. Even as early uh, uh, as this morning, I received a further email stating the same thing. Uh, and there's four months, three months of a difference in, in when I last asked. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that there's been no progress or movement on this whatsoever. And I've asked a series of questions of CA today. But certainly, if it's the DE, if the Department of Education is responsible, we need clarification on that. And we need some movement on it. Members agreed? Thank you. Great. Thanks. And then finally, on page, uh, sorry, not finally, page 141 is a copy of the CA important accounts. So same as last time, it's a lengthy document. Um, I've read it, but I will send it to you again um, over the summer with some scrutiny points if there are things that we need to follow up on. Uh, is members content to note this for now? Agreed. Great members, yeah. Great, Agreed, yeah. And then finally this time, uh, in tabled correspondence at page 238 is a notice of a review of arm's length bodies by the Department of Finance. Uh, it seems that all ALVs, all arms length bodies of all statuses are included. This came out of the new DNA um, agreements, and this is due to report in the autumn, so it's going to be short, short and sharp, apparently. So, members can tend to note. Agreed. Great. Okay, okay, Agreed. Okay, agenda item nine, members, forward work programme. Can I refer members to draft forward work programme on page 655 of the meeting pack and ask the clerk to speak to this item? Right, thanks, uh, Chairperson. Members, as previously discussed and as agreed, the committee will, of course, meet during summer recess. Uh, I've scheduled a meeting for Thursday, 20th at 10.30. Um, so it's a Thursday. I'm sorry about that. Um, and witnesses and members, if they choose, can use Starleaf. So the reason for that day is... The week before is A-Level Results Day, and um, that day is GCSE Results Day. So um, I, I don't know, I presume everything will go well, but if there are any issues with complaints about A-Levels, they will take a couple of days to percolate, so that by the time we get to the 20th of August, um, the position should be clearer. Um, likewise, uh, as members are aware, what's happening is it's, it's teacher-assessed grades. There's a... A statistical model so that you, were, you wouldn't expect to see any great changes in the number of A's, B's and C's going from one year to the next. It's going to be the same. The issue will be about individual results where someone didn't get what they wanted and uh, they may have issues then with the complaints process. So that's the idea of the timing. Also, that's just a week before restart. For, which is the 24th of uh, August. So it may be, as the Minister hinted earlier, that there will be revised public health guidance um, out before this, and they either much of the expected difficulty that is being talked about will either materialise or it won't. And so that will be a, quite a good time to, uh, for the committee to meet. If other education issues arise in the interim, these could be taken forward by the ad hoc committee at any time during the summer, so the ad hoc committee can meet in August if that is required. If, however, if members absolutely require an additional education committee meeting between now and the 20th of August, what they should do is seek the support of the chairperson. If there seems to be a quorum, then the chair will contact the committee and member support office. They will find a clerk and they will find a team who will support such a meeting uh, if that is required. So that can definitely be done, no problem. 
Um, well, not no problem, but it can definitely be done, and uh, the, uh, the secretary will be happy to facilitate. But as I say, there are a couple of options there, and if all else fails, we're back on the 20th of August when there should be plenty to uh, talk about. So, Chair, can I ask if the committee are content in respect of the above? Yeah, um, just just to echo what the clerk has said there, members. Um, there are obviously a range of important issues, ongoing issues affecting education. Um, A-level results Thursday the 13th, GCSE Thursday the 20th, school restart Monday the 24th. I think it is important that this committee does meet at that time. Um, and as the clerk has said, if any member um, and indeed any issue arises um, that merits a meeting of this education committee, then there are mechanisms in place to allow us to do that. Don't hesitate to contact me and we will ensure that that can take place um, during July and August. Are members content with that? Any questions or comments? Content? No. Okay, that's great. Uh, okay, then, um, can I ask members if there are items of business that they want the clerk to schedule uh, for the for forward work program in August and September, or you content sure. to consider that on, uh, at those sessions? Sure. Justin, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, as you said earlier, you know, I've been a strong advocate for physical activity and the importance of physical activity for school children. And we've had lots of evidence given from people who are presenting evidence on mental health, on emotional well-being, on saying, on all the different aspects of education. But we're nobody in providing the evidence session on physical activity. And an organization I've become familiar with over recent years who have grown and have made an impact on schools already is an organization called Healthy Kids. They're, they provide an holistic health program uh, created to allow every citizen to achieve their best possible state of well-being, which incorporates not just alone the pupils, it's the teachers, it's the parents, and it's very, very popular amongst school children globally already. They've already got a service which is, is making a global impact, and they're passionate about what they do, and I feel it would be very, very beneficial to have them present from the committee if, if other members could support that. Yes. Um, is that something that we could take as a an, an informal uh, committee meeting basis, Justin, given the schedule is likely to be fairly yeah. um, occupied in, in those first few weeks of August? Informally be fine, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Um, perhaps if, if the member, sorry, right. Chair, if the member would view the email, me, Justin, with just the contact details and the name of the company, just we're having trouble with the sound. That's grand. Okay, lovely. Uh, Justin, can I, can I, can I build on your proposal there, Justin? That that healthier lifestyles for children motion um, that was proposed on the eleventh of October, twenty sixteen. Um, Clark, would if I provide you a link to that motion and some details of that, would members be? content for the committee to write to the minister to ask what progress has been made on the uh, the aspects of that motion that were agreed by the assembly we've agreed that excellent duplication by me apologies it's getting late in the day and the term um okay uh, any other items of business members wish to suggest for forward work in in august or september no okay any other business members No. Okay. Um, as the clerk has said, then members, the the next scheduled committee meeting is Thursday, the twentieth of August, in Room Twenty Nine, Parliament Buildings, and via Starleaf. Um, but I would emphasize, if if any member feels that an issue needs to be considered by this education committee in the interim, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, and I would ask as well that we all. Uh, seek to respond positively to any request of uh, a meeting of the Education Committee to take place as I'm conscious there are a, a range of issues still um, extremely pertinent for education at this time. But um, in lieu of that, thank you for all the, the work that we've undertaken um, during the, the pandemic. We've covered a, a very wide range of issues and um, we'll continue to, uh, to do so to stand up for the education sector in Northern Ireland. Thank you, members. Thank you. Thanks, members. Thank Meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, Boris. <laughs> Thanks. All this is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.